Reddit, what's the most ultimate petty revenge you've seen or been a part of? I occasionally deliver pizza as a part-time job. There is a customer that tends to pay with a big bag of change. I don't mean a bag full of quarters, I mean a bag full of dimes, nickels, and pennies. Since his meal typically costs about $20, the bag usually weighs several pounds. It is a total pain to count out all of the change, so typically drivers will just assume that he has the correct amount and leave. Usually, he has just enough or maybe a few cents over. I don't think it is an innocent thing either, as he usually gives the bag of change with a sheet-eating grin. It is such a pain that most of the drivers know his address by heart and avoid going to his house, if at all possible. I was having a bad night and by the luck of the draw got this dude's house. I remembered reading a post on r slash revenge involving someone paying in a checkout line with a bag of change and I knew I could use a similar method to take my frustration out on this guy in the pettiest way possible. I pulled up to his house and left the pizza in the car. I rang the doorbell, and when he answered I saw the large bag of change in his hand that I knew would be there. He asked where his pizza was, and I said new policy, sir. Gotta count it out before we can give out the pizza. So I sat down on his doorstep and started to count out all of the change. At one point, I even asked if he could turn on his pork light because I was having a hard time seeing. He did end up sitting there while I counted out the entire bag of change, even though it took about 10 minutes. He ended up being about a dollar over, so I started picking up pennies to give him his change back when he said that I could keep the rest as a tip. When I gave him his pizza, he sheepishly told me sorry and then shut the door. The whole situation was incredibly awkward, and to my knowledge he hasn't ordered pizza from us in a while. Oh well. My roommate in college was a selfish dick. Now I have known him since preschool, and we are still friends, but he is one of those people you cannot live with. He attended the local tech school that is supposed to be a pipeline into the main school that third roommate and I attended. However he barely went to class and sat around getting high and playing Zbox. My Zbox specifically, which is where this story begins. He used to have friends over all the time and mostly, they'd get baked and play box in the living room. Now I don't like having a TV in my bedroom, so I set up my flat screen and box in the living room. I'd like to note that both he and third room had had boxes as well, but they had this set up in their respective rooms. When the latest, at the time, Call of Duty came out, we would spend hours playing together in a big squad. That is until third room at box got the red ring of death. Shortly after, my Zbox got the red ring of death. Well we think it's all good, because Decrumat has the next gen Zbox 360 that wasn't prone to the same issue. We'll just move his Zbox out to the living room, so we can keep playing COD Zombies. The response third rumored, and I got was, and I quote, Nah, I don't want people playing it all the time, because it will probably break. Plus what if you and third rumored are playing it, and I want to play by myself. We were livid. How could he spend all that time using my stuff and not extend the same courtesy? At the time, I had supplied the router for the internet in the house, which meant I alone had the admin password. I also found out you can block specific MAC addresses. Well guess who couldn't connect as Barkslove when he wanted to play online? I would turn it on and off sporadically over the next few weeks. I found out he spent like 4 hours calling both Time Warner and Microsoft trying to get the issue resolved. Eventually he started to put 2 and 2 together about when it would go out and come back. You'd think I would stop, but I adapted. I found out that you could open a port to remotely access your router from the internet. At the time I had a Blackberry, I know I know, which could load the HTML router config page. Thus, I started turning off his access when I was gone. I was even away one weekend at our rival school and shut him down from 3 hours away. To this day he still doesn't know it was me. I still go over to his house and hang out on the weekends. Fuck you dude, I know they taught us sharing in preschool. Edit, to those saying I was the dick in the situation, I think you're confused that this is some sort of revenge slash friendship ending act when really it was me elaborately pranking a friend of 20 plus years. Yes he was a dick in the sense that he was still immature in a lot of ways because he had never lived on his own. He never cleaned, did his part in the household, etc. 
He's cool now that life smacked him around a bit. He just needed to grow up at the time. My real gripe was not that I couldn't use his bucks, it was that we no longer would sit down as three friends, crack some beers, and laugh having fun trying to beat each other's high round score in zombies. It was like us being social together stopped because he wanted to play MW2 by himself and shut us out. Boss paged me on my wedding night, yeah, bad on me for leaving the pager on but in my defense it automatically turned on after charging, and I wanted to have a full battery before setting off on my honeymoon trip. He did it as a joke, but it came at an inappropriate moment. We had a page, only if something's on fire policy, so I had to call in, even though I had just gotten married and was about to go on two weeks vacation. When he answered, he laughed so hard I just had to do something about it. So when I got back I programmed the mail servers to call out on their phone lines and hit his pager with dial back numbers for phone search services. At 4am, every day, his wife got this pager before he did one time and saw a text message something like I loved how you described how you would fuck me, Jerry, call back when your wife's gone for the day. Wife was not amused. She thought he'd been calling phone search operators and tore him a new one. He knew it was me, but he was too stubborn to ask me to call it off. So it kept up for weeks until he finally figured out where the script was running from and used it to page me instead. We had a back and forth pager war for a while, but then it all faked up when an actual data center emergency happened and one of us ignored the page thinking it was the other pranking him. That ended the fun. My little brother and his girlfriend came to stay at my house for the weekend, and the girlfriend was super self-centered and obnoxious. When they left, she forgot her clothes and toiletries because she left them sprawled all over my bathroom. About a week later, she and my brother moved into an apartment together. After he paid for the moving truck, deposit, and utilities, she cheated on him with her ex and kicked him out of the apartment. This left him broke, homeless, and heartbroken. In the days after the breakup, she kept calling and emailing him several times per day, demanding that he ask me to ship her clothes and toiletries back to her. I mean, it's really important. It's my north face. My brother called and pleaded with me to ship them to her, so she would stop having a reason to contact him. Being the loving sister that I am, I gathered up the really important north face sweatshirt, shorts, underwear, shampoo, conditioner, soap, and razor. I folded everything nicely. I then wrote a nice note apologizing for taking so long to mail them to her and let her know that I hope all is well. The note was written in permanent marker and the paper happened to be resting on the really important north face when I wrote it. Unfortunately, the ink bled straight through the paper and onto the shirt. Also unfortunately, the shampoo, soap, and conditioner caps were not tightly secured on their bottles and the contents leaked out all over the clothes further spreading the ink. The most unfortunate result, though, was that her razor didn't have any sort of protective cap or container and left little slashes all over the front of the really important north face. She received the package, and my brother never heard from her again. I lived in a cheap crappy apartment with roommates and we all worked in fast food. Money was tight. One roommate ended up unemployed for a few weeks and then got a job as a bank teller, making much better money. However while unemployed she had missed a rent payment, which we had scraped together to cover for her. Two weeks into the new job she gets her first paycheck, obviously we are expecting immediate payback. Day one she says something along the lines of she couldn't do personal business, cash her check, during work so she could pay us in a couple of days. The Friday she was supposed to pay us, she comes home with a big shopping bag and casually mentions she can't pay back rent, yet because she had to buy new work clothes. When roommates and I got upset she went total beach on us, that we didn't understand how to work a professional job because we were only food service, and basically told us we would get our money when she felt like it. That weekend she misplaced her Namatag required at work. She spent hours searching for it. At some point, I came across the Namatag in a random spot and said nothing. She kept searching for it all weekend and was panicked that she would look bad to her boss, etc. I never moved or took the Namatag, but the whole time I knew where it was. She never found it and had to get a new one. 
She also never paid the back rent and we kicked her out a few weeks later. Not me, but a friend's story from his time in the military, receives care package from grandparents of 7 pounds of homemade fudge and cookies, but immediately has to go on a long mission, like 2 months long. Instructs his bunkmates to wait for his return and all will be shared. He returns, there's less than a pound left. There's initial outrage to be sure, but he's calm about it. You'd rather see his outrage than his calm face, because that's when he's plotting your demise. Weeks and months pass, and he has plotted. Finally he's scheduled to be in the same vehicle as them. The night before, he chows down on two boxes of Oreos and a gallon of milk. Lactose intolerant. His head is sticking out the top hatch, and made a seal with his belt and equipment. Just as they got too far to return, he lets loose the most vile, sickening flatulence he was happy to, quite literally, sheet his pants. The guys inside ended up vomiting all over the inside of the vehicle, and ended up having to pay my friend back the market value of the fudge, which he never got to taste again, because his grandmother passed away, before being able to make another batch. Now this was a couple years back, when I was in college. My friend, we'll call her Sissy, and I were both going into our second years. So was her boyfriend Brad, his real name, because fuck you Brad. So Sissy finds out that she has herpes. The only guy she has ever been with is Brad. Naturally she is devastated to find out he's been cheating. We find out that she is not the only one he infected. There are in fact at least 5 other women we find out about. What's more we find out Brad has known that he is positive and still going around hooking up with people and saying that he is healthy. Basically his attitude is that someone gave it to him, so why would it be wrong for him to spread it to? Yeah, Brad is an asshole of epic proportions. Sissy is just devastated and can't get out of her funk and what she now has to deal with health wise. Now there is an urban legend where as Revenger woman hid, I think, shrimp in her cheating so's curtain rods when she was forced to move out of their apartment. This story has been featured on many shows about urban legends. It just so happened to come on late one night when me and Sissy were watching TV. Problem was Brad had 5 roommates. So no way, that was going to work. But wait Brad has a car. And Brad is too broke to afford a new car anytime soon. She knows the door code to unlock the vehicle and I just so happen to know how to remove certain vehicle panels to access holes in other panels that it would be impossible to get shrimp out of. Plus he worked the early shift on wet, lucky us it's Tuesday night. So off we go to the store to buy the clearance section of meat and seafood out. We are talking ground beef, shrimp, imitation crab meat, various kinds of fish and deviled eggs. Oh, and during this lovely time of September our little town was experiencing a triple digit heat wave. So off we go in the middle of the night, when it's still 90 degrees out, and get to work. Luckily for us Brad lives in a sheety apartment with no security cameras and other tenants who don't car about two women working on a vehicle at 1am. Sure enough the door key code still works. So we pop out these little covers on the door's panels that access the interior of the door. In goes the tiny little shrimps. Then we remove the plastic panels from the wheel wells. And in goes some ground beef and deviled eggs. Next was his lift gate. Anyway you get the idea. We put his car back together and off we go. Over the next few days the smell just got worse and worse. The apartment complex manager asked him to move the car off grounds because of the smell. Our town also has some mean feral cats that roam around, they just faking loved hanging around his car. So not only did it stink, but he risked being attacked by some mean as feral cats. He would have to always have the windows cracked open at least a little. Best part is Brad, and I have the same major. So over the next 3 years I see him a lot. He became notorious for his horrible smelling car. He couldn't afford to replace it, no one would buy it, no matter how many times he had it cleaned the smell remained, and no one could figure out where the odor was coming from. Even if they had figured it out most of the panels would need to be completely replaced, because the only access is tiny holes. To this day people still ask him about his car on Facebook. Like, if he says he will pick people up they ask him if he has a new conope. Still the stink mobile. He currently works at Starbucks. So that thing isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Kind of like his herpes. I like to think of this as my ultimate Sherlock Holmes level petty revenge slash prank. 
I will never top the awesomeness of this one. It was my faking masterpiece. TLDR. Guy knowingly gave my friend herpes. So we took parts of his car off and hid various meats and fish inside during a heat while fuck you brat, I hope you see this and know the brilliance of our petty revenge. Edit 1. Thanks for the reddit gold. And thank you reddit for making my highest rated comment about how I hid fish slash meat in some asshole's car our petty revenge. For those asking, she didn't want to file charges as it would become public record. We did report him anonymously to the CDC. Someone did go and talk to him that he had been named in several complaints. We encouraged the other women we knew of to do the same. One woman filed a lawsuit against him, but it's hard to prove in court that he did it intentionally nothing came of it. Your own personal doctor or your local planned parenthood, if you live in the US, can provide you with information of STD slash STIS and how to prevent the spread or prevent contracting something. Planned Parenthood also provides low cost or free screenings. Many adults do not display symptoms. So it is worth getting checked out on a regular basis. It doesn't hurt to do it, but it could hurt not to. Stay safe out there editors. So this was in the video game EVE Online. The game has a PvP, player vs player, policy of punish instead of prevent meaning that anywhere in the game anyone can legally shoot anyone for any reason. There are certain places where, if you shoot someone first then your own ship will be shot by invincible NPC police. However, there is a time gap between when you start shooting the innocent player and when the NPC police kill your ship, 10 seconds. So players will gank other innocent players knowing full well they will lose their own ship as a result. This is allowed and encouraged by the devs and is one of the most defining features of EVE Online. So this one dude gets bored and decides to gank a very new player who is in a, practically, free ship. Keep in mind the attacking player's ship is easily worth 5 times this new player's ship and he is doing this purely as a troll. So 15 seconds later, there are 2 exploded ships. The new player just goes off. Like a solid 15 minute rant of pure 13 year old rage. He explains that this, very cheap, ship is his entire net worth and that he will be quitting the game because he has nothing left. The attacking player actually feels pretty bad, and because Eve is notorious for not retaining new players, decides to reimburse the new player's ship. He gives the guy 100 million ISK, the in-game currency. Now, this is a huge amount of money to a new player. The new player could afford about 100 of the ship he just lost. This is enough to keep the new player going for months. Then, 30 seconds after giving the new player the money, the old player gets a notification. New player has placed a bounty on your head for 100 million ISK. The new player took every last cent and used it to put a price on the old player's head. Now anyone who kills the old player will get the bounty. The new player then logged off. I can't recall the chat logs, but they looked something like, Old player, hey I'm sorry about your ship. I gave you 100 mil to keep you going for the next month or so. New player has placed a bounty on your head for 100 million ISK. New player has logged off. Edit. Shameless shoutout Eve is now free to play. It is also more new player friendly than ever. If you would like to give it a try PM me. I'm in a 5000 person nullsec alliance that takes in and trains day one players. We even have a dojo plan that provides new players with a welcome package of free ships and skill books. We have no time requirements or participation requirements either. Joining takes less than an hour and we have people that will walk you through it. My dad wants to chop down the trees in our yard. He has had to rake their leaves over the last 20 years. He is retired now and now hires people to do the raking. My mom loves the trees because she loves nature. So they frequently fight over it. My mom wants to go to Europe with my dad and my dad wants the trees cut down. He refuses to go to Europe until at least two trees of his choosing are chopped down. My mom won't let him chop them down, so they aren't going anywhere. When I ask my dad why he wants to cut them down so badly, since he doesn't even rake anymore, he professed his deep-seated hatred for those damn trees. He wanted them dead for revenge. Seemed like he had PTSD too. The trees remind him of all the horrible memories raking. Edit. Everyone recommending to poison the trees. I appreciate the idea, but I don't want to do that to my mom. And she would probably find out anyway. She's smart. It would be disastrous for me and my dad. 
Even if he had nothing to do with it, she would blame him. So this is pretty messed up but here it goes. Once lived in her apartment with my best friend, not a real nice place, but the price was right. So our neighbor on one side was a middle aged lady with two sons. Let's say 13 and 16 years old. These boys were all gothic out, and kind of weird, but they seemed to be good kids. They were always outside sitting on our shared steps. After we had been there for a while we figured out why. Their mother was absolutely terrible to these boys. Through our thin walls we could hear the daily verbal abuse, constant yelling and name calling. As a result we hated this lady. She was a terrible person. We would occasionally let the boys come in and play video games or hang out for a few minutes if it was raining or cold so they didn't have to go home. Anyway, one night my friend and I get pissed drunk and somehow find a freshly dead groundhog. This evil lady's car happened to be unlocked. It was some shitty 80s four door. We gutted this dead groundhog and shoved it under her driver's seat. It was like the middle of summer. You can imagine the stench that must have come from that car, so the car did not move for 3 or 4 days. Then one day it is gone, and we never saw it again. We didn't put much thought into our drunken plan and unfortunately a few days later we heard the lady blaming one of the kids for the car. She didn't say a lot about it, and of course the kids didn't know a thing about it. This was years ago, and I'm not proud of what we did, but that's not to say that evil beach didn't deserve it. So this one may take a while, so I'm sorry about this. I'm slash was in the navy, and on my first ship, I had a small group of friends. We were very close, and spent most of our time together. In the military you have to build up time to take off, and two of my friends decided to take a trip to Ohio for some reason. They went through the process of requesting the time off, and got it approved. They were in the process of booking a flight, when another one of our shipmates, sailors, overheard them talking about booking flights. He told them he was taking that leave as well, and was heading somewhere, and could drop them off, it was on his way. Fast forward to the day of leave, my friends are packed up ready to go, and the other sailor said he was ready to go, and would meet them on the pier, to take them to Ohio. I hung out with them on the pier, since we were close, and I was off, but was leaving. That day two hours passed, and they received a phone call that he was running a little late and would be there in an hour five hours later. My friend said screw it and booked flights. Cost them around 300, 400 extra dollars, and being E3s that was a lot of money. Scumbag finally met up with them and gave them a lengthy excuse on why he left them on the pier, and it was bullshit to say the least. My friends were pissed, and even though he didn't actually do anything wrong, wrong he still screwed them over. I slept on the rack underneath the now scumbag, and already didn't like him. He wasn't very reliable, and smelled kind of bad, which was a common occurrence when you lived in close quarters, but it could give people a negative stigma about you. One day, out to sea I got tired of his smell, and was still pretty perturbed about what he did to my friends, so I decided to switch his sock out with one of mine. Only my sock wasn't used for my feet, it was used for my alone time. I waited until he fell asleep and took his shoe, then shook his old sock out, he reused his socks. I slid my 3 day use crusty jizz sock into his shoe and set my alarm for when he got up. He then woke up, used the bathroom, and got ready for watch. He took his shoe down, pulled the sock out, noticed something was weird. Peeled the sock open and brought it to his mouth slash nose to smell. It literally touched his lips. Then put the sock on and went to stand his 12 hour watch. I waited a long time to tell my friends as I didn't want anyone finding that out. But once that guy went UA, unauthorized absence, and never returned, I told my friends and they were pretty happy with my decision. TLDR. Someone abandoned my friends on the pier, so I switched his sock out with my jizz sock. Well, for the entire retty of high school, I lived with my aunt and uncle, because my parents wanted to make sure I got a good education. There was one day in high school, that I was super cold. I didn't have a clean hoodie to wear, so I borrowed my cousins. I had second period with my cousin's younger brother, and he looks at me, and nods in disappointment. You know you shouldn't be wearing that, right? I explained that I was in a hurry, and if it was such an issue I'd wash the hoodie and put it back. He shrugs his shoulders. 
Later in the day, I'm getting off the bus and my cousin calls me from DC, where he's going to college. He chews me out for an hour over this hoodie. He said some pretty nasty shit. So I retaliated I said at least I don't have to worry about my brothers doing drugs, super petty in hindsight. I wish I hadn't had said that, because shit hits the fan from here. His younger brother, the one that ratted me out, had just started smoking weed. My family is super anti-drugs, so that was a huge issue. DC cousin tells his parents. Parents chewed younger bro and me out, and force us to take drug tests. Before taking his test, younger bro rats me out for drinking alcohol before prom. I passed, he failed. The family is crying, and there was a clear divide between my cousin's family and me. I was literally told that I broke the family apart, and I got berated some more. He ends up getting sent to Valley Forge and my aunt slash uncle said you're lucky you're going to college it will straighten you out. I drank more alcohol slash smoke more weed over those 5 years than ever before. But I did end up getting straightened out. I drink socially and don't smoke anymore because I'm finishing my masters in a health profession. I actively avoided going to their house for any family events for 7 years. Had I simply just taken the as whooping and not said anything about him doing drugs, it would have been a minor inconvenience that would have gone away, but sometimes you don't think of this sheet when you're 17. It was petty and it backfired. TLDR, my pettiness almost destroyed my relative's family edit, I didn't go in the room to get his hoodie, it was in a communal closet in the sunroom right next to the exit. This hasn't happened yet, it should commence in roughly 3 hours. My current job is not all that great small company cronies and all that. But what makes it truly crap is the management and ownership attitude. We are treated like throwaway items, not people. We've had a fair amount of people let go recently, most of them for cost cutting reasons. When some of these terminated employees pointed out that the holiday season is a shitty time for planned reductions, they literally got told not my problem, that's your problem. When we are forced to perform jobs without adequate equipment, funds, parts, etc. Not my problem, make it work light to the customer, if you need to, it's your issue, not mine I'm the last surviving member of my department. I'm doing the jobs of 3 people, just to keep operations running. I'm by no means vital to company survival, but there will be pain, if my workshop sits idle. I'm turning in my final timesheet today, without notice. My new job starts next week. I think it's petty revenge, but that's okay. Not my problem, right? Edit, my first reddit gold. Thank you friend. Update, for those asking, I worked my whole shift instead of leaving an hour early. While I don't like my employer, I like my fellow employees, so I made sure the person most likely to be forced to fill in for me was set up as best as I could manage. One manager had a definite OFAC look as I told him, but he was the only decent manager we have, he even wished me luck. The other didn't seem to give a damn, and promptly ignored me, until I left the office, after I turned in my company gear. No goodbye, no reaction, just went back to tapping on the phone, like I wasn't there. Update 2, I'm home, adult beverage in hand. While I'm happy to be rid of such a soul crushing job, I will miss a fair number of my cowalkers. They are great people stuck in a crap job. But I'm going to enjoy an extended weekend before starting the new gig. Better pay, better benefits, and I will be able to see some new places. I can honestly say I never expected my little plan to get so much attention. You all are making me blush. Hopefully not too terribly late. Two instances, as a young kid, like from age 4, until she disappeared with the summer and a HVAC tech who apparently serviced her, as well as our actual furnace on a repair call, my stepmother would make me wait on her hand and foot. At first, it was fun, and I felt useful, but it became apparent that she was totally taking advantage of me especially when my dad wasn't around. Back quote take out the trash, clean not only your room, but the bathrooms and kitchen. Back quote get me, name the item, fetch my cigarettes, m get the lighter, etc. all the time. One of her regular requests was back quote get me a glass of water. Now, we lived in a sprawling ranch, single floor, house at the time, with the kitchen on one end and the Florida room, a type of living area with windows on all sides, 
sort of like an all-seasons room at the opposite end and the step monster's favorite place to lounge. Well, it was a walk for anyone, let alone a barely 3 foot tall little kid, and then, of course, she wanted her water quickly, so I'd double time it, spilling water all along the route in the process and getting yelled at for that, as well. About a third of the way to the kitchen was a powder room. It was around a corner, and off a hallway not visible from the Florida room, so instead of going all the way to the kitchen, climbing a footstool to reach the tap, and carefully, but quickly, coming all the way back, I'd simply detour into the bath for water. It didn't matter that I couldn't reach the tap and except for some mild, taste-questioning lip smacking, she never found out I was dipping her glass in the toilet bowl to fill it. 2. My uncle was a prominent busy doctor. My aunt, a stay-at-home mother of two. My uncle was very rigid and authoritative and had to have things just so. A certain breakfast at a specific time every morning. His clothes folded or hung in a particular way. A specific drink waiting for him upon his return home. And a specific dinner at a given time every night. Based on a rotating menu. Pork chops say. Monday turkey. Tuesday. Etc. This went on for decades, until he eventually passed. Regardless, one night was meatloaf night, and after years of no complaints, my uncle erupts, screaming at my aunt that her meatloaf is simply garbage, how could she not be able to cook something so simple, and others, and literally fires his full dinner plate across the room. My aunt, his submissive, quiet, loyal servant over there then 20 or so years of marriage, simply apologizes and cleans up promising to improve her recipe. It was only after my uncle died they were married for 52 years that she admitted to my mother that she's fed him meatloaf and solely of Alpo, wet, canned dog food, for the past 30 years with Nari a complaint. Edit, Nari, not Bart, a complaint. Room at in college was disgustingly messy and a raging beach. When I had the flu once, I had left a blanket and sweatshirt in the living room to keep warm. Woke up to a text along the lines of you're a disgusting pig. The apartment is a disaster. Get all of your belongings out of the living area or we're going to have a problem. And honestly if she had nicely asked then fine. And if she weren't insanely messy then fine. But she had to go full out beach. She had forgotten that I had provided all of the furniture for our apartment. Couch, table, TV etc. All my belongings. So, while she was in class, I called up some friends on the football team that occasionally helped people move for spare cash. We loaded up every single piece of furniture onto their truck and just parked it a few blocks away on the street. Cue my roommate coming home to an empty faking apartment. Screaming at me and calling me names. I just told her I was following her orders and I moved out all of my belongings. She was dumbfounded and really had nothing to say. Obviously brought the furniture back hours later, but certainly proved my point. To be honest that's only one of many petty points I had to make to that beach. When I was a senior in high school, I was in a group English project with two other people. We had to read the assigned book, and over the course of a month or so we had several mini projects to do before the final presentation. These many projects were designed so that each person would be covering a different section of the book and they would all be combined for the finished product. The night before the first mini project was due, I learned that neither one of my group members planned on putting any more effort into the work into the project than spark notes and bullshit. I ended up pulling several all-nighters trying to just get a passing grade. Fast forward to the day of our final presentation. We were going to be the last group to present putting us after the lunch break in the middle of class. What I hadn't told anyone was that I was going to the blood drive that our school was having during lunch to donate. I go, donate, and spend a couple minutes making sure I'm not going to pass out afterwards. I come back to the classroom and find my group halfway through the prezi I had made for the presentation. Apparently they had been floundering, making sheet up on the fly, and making it very clear to everyone that they had never read the book or had any idea WHT the fact was going on. Teacher has her head in her hands. I walk back in and my group says, oh thank god he's back. I restart the prizzy, give the presentation, and took my seat. Explained what happened to the teacher after class. Got a passing grade 90% sure they failed. 
When I was a freshman in high school, I rode the school bus with the middle school and high school kids. We had this one little special snowflake on our bus that year, who just didn't understand how the bus worked. He would get on the bus and try and sit with the high school kids and would harass the younger kids to try and get our attention. He would say all sorts of gross and nasty things to the girls on the bus and laugh thinking we would think he was cool. I kept telling this kid it wasn't cool and the only thing he was doing was ticking us off with his immaturity. Being a special snowflake he thought he just needed to up his antics. So one day, I'm sitting on the bus listening to my awesome CD player and trying to forget about the day I had. This kid had other ideas and decided to continue to harass a bunch of young girls on the bus. The words coming out of his mouth were so over the top and nasty that two of this girls started crying and that's when I had enough of this kid's issues. I told him very nicely to stop it or I would make him stop and he wasn't going to like what I did. He just smiled and turned around and continued to harass these girls. So I got out of my seat and pushed him over into his seat and sat down. I got real close to his face and started to tell him off. He turned his head away from me to ignore what I was telling him. So I grabbed him by his hair, mind you I had winter gloves on at the time, and turned him to face me. I told him that if he ever harassed another kid on the school bus that I would make sure that he didn't walk home when he got off the bus but would be crawling from the as whooping that would come his way. I could tell this kid was a little scared but I don't think he thought I was serious. I got up out of my seat and told the girls to let me know if he so much as smiled at them wrong and I went back to my seat. The next day my parents get a call from the school or schools that there is going to be a meeting with both the middle school and high school principals, the bus driver, the kid and his parents and my parents. The special snowflakes parents wanted me to be suspended for harassing their baby and they weren't going down without a fight. This is where I decide to get my revenge and take this kid down. After everyone arrives the meeting gets started and the adults want to hear each kid's side of the story. I told them that the special snowflake can go first, and I listened and waited to see what he had to say. He goes on this long ramble about how mean and horrible I have been to him since the school year has started and how he feels harassed by me every day and doesn't feel safe on the same bus as me. The whole time, my dad is taking notes as the kid is talking, and at one point his parents stop the kid and ask my dad what he was doing. My dad looks up from his notebook and stared straight into the kid's father's eyes and says I need accurate notes for a lawyer. Then went back to taking notes. The kid's father just snorts and says, you forget what your kid's done to mine. I should be the one taking the notes. The special snowflake ends his sob story with those special tears and even has this smirk on his face as if he won the war. After he was done, the adults, not my parents though, looked at me like I was the worst kid they have ever had to deal with and they were ready to throw me out of their school that very moment. I started off by asking the adults in the room when they will be reviewing the video from the school bus. As a side note, the school that year had put cameras in all the new school buses so that in the event of something like this happening there would be documentation and proof. However what the school didn't tell the parents was that not all the buses had functioning cameras. It turned out that every one out of three buses had a camera that was recording the other two buses just had the dummy cameras. I had found out the first few weeks of school that our bus only had a dummy camera because our bus driver had never had any problems on her route and she didn't request her bus to have one. I had asked her when we first got the bus and I notice that the camera didn't have a red light on during the ride. So I knew when the special snowflake and I had a little discussion that there wasn't going to be a recording. So after I asked that, the principals had to explain to both sets of parents that the camera was actually a dummy camera and there was no recording. So I went on with my side of the story and advised all the adults that the kid was lying and that I never actually laid my hands on him. I however admitted to his father and mother that yes I did threaten the kid and that I know I shouldn't have but their child was out of control. The revenge part, I pulled out of my backpack a list that I had started to compile after the officer showed up at my house and the time of the meeting. I had gone to every person on our school bus and had them write down everything they could remember that this special snowflake had been saying to them since school had started. At the time of the meeting, I had four pages of handwritten quotes from all the kids. 
I asked the adults in the room if it was okay for me to read off what this kid had been saying to the young girls on the school bus. They of course gave me the go ahead and I started to list all the things he was saying. Each time I got to a swear word or nasty statement, I would hesitate and ask if it was okay if I said these words out loud. I think I had gotten only 5 or 6 of quotes out before the adults told me to stop. I made everyone in the room so uncomfortable with what this kid had been saying to all the young girls that they couldn't listen to it anymore. When I looked up the special little snowflakes father looked like he was ready to have a heart attack. His face was a shade of red I had never seen before. As I was about to continue on to why I did what I did, the father interrupted me. He turns to his son and asked him if any of these things were true that he supposedly said. The kid of course started to stutter and tried to say no. I looked at the principals and the adults and pulled out my last bit of revenge, yet another list. I handed it to the middle school principal and advised her that each of those names on the list were kids that were harassed and are willing to come in with their parents to discuss what has been happening on the school bus. At this point the kid just all out started bawling his eyes out to the point that snot and tears were running down his face and shirt and he couldn't talk. After a few minutes he finally calmed down and his father told him he had one more chance to tell the truth otherwise things were going to be very serious when they got home. The kid finally looked up from the table and said in the weakest voice that yes he did say all those things to the girls on the bus. I swear to this day, the look on his father's face was worth all the hassle that my parents and I went through. The kid's father looked like his eyeballs were going to pop out of his head because it was about to explode it. Around this time, the other adults in the room started to apologize to me about how things escalated to this point and how they can't agree with my actions, they can understand how it happened. I looked the special snowflake in the eye and asked him to explain to the adults in the room that he had also lied about me putting my hands on him. Everyone waited for his response and all the kid could say was sorry, I lied about that too. In the end the special snowflake was so special that mom and dad had to drive him to school every day because he was kicked off the bus for the remaining school year. His was petty revenge executed on me by a friend. Executed flawlessly. At some point back in the late 90s early zeros my friends and I started trolling each other by sending each other links to what were supposed to be legit pictures, normally of each other hanging out, something cool, etc, but were actually pictures of plant stands. It got so bad that we started refusing to click links sent around and coined the phrase don't plant stand me. Flares up and down for several years as my friends move away from New York City and around the country, but continue to share pictures slash funny links slash etc. We would also keep track of who had gotten who most recently, and I don't even remember what I'd done, but I'd plant standed one of them particularly badly. Fast forward about a year, I'm getting married. Everyone is invited, including this friend who is going to stay at my place during the wedding. She drives up in a rental and asks me to help bring her bags in. I'm so excited to see her I rush out and grab a couple and carry them into the guest room and get her all set up. It's a great wedding and my wife and I head off to our honeymoon for a week saying goodbye to everyone before we go. When I get back to my house another week or so goes by before I have to get something from the closet in the guest room. And that's when I find it. A huge wrought iron plant stand smack in the middle of the room. This friend of mine found, bought, disassembled, flew to another country, reassembled and left the plant stand in my guest room. And I helped carry it into my own damn house. Needless to say, she won. We don't plant stand anymore. There's no point. Had an ex-roommate whose girlfriend over time just started living at our house and refused to chip in on rent and utilities, even after multiple conversations about how it would be more beneficial to split things between us all. There were three of us living there before she started being a leech. Each month the utility bills went up, which really pissed me off because they were in my name. The house had one garage, but a double wide driveway. My roommates and I had it planned out who parked where according to who left for work at such and such times. The girlfriend started parking in my space leaving me to park in the street and throwing off the parking arrangements. She also ruined a few pots and pans my mother had given to me by using metal utensils and then leaving them in the sink to get rusty. 
After a while she stopped socializing and sequestered herself in his room all the time and we got mice because she was keeping food in the bedroom. The thing that really pushed me over the edge though was when I discovered she had been using my cosmetics when she had her own. Ended up getting pink eye because she just wouldn't stop using my Macube even after I removed it all from the bathroom. My petty revenge was pissing in her shampoo. Not a little squirt either. I made sure to get nice and dehydrated and filled a solo cup then poured it into her bulk sized shampoo bottle and shook it up. This happened years ago and it still gets me riled up like nothing else. No regrets. I was at a guitar store once, I'm not a very good guitar player, but I was shopping for an amp and decided to try a few out. I pulled a guitar down from the wall, plugged into an amp, and started tweaking the settings to my liking. A guy in a wheelchair came up, plugged into the amp next to me, and dimmed the volume, then proceeded to play some master, battery metal licks. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, powered off the amp that I was testing, and walked across the room to another amp, plugged in and started fiddling with settings again. Again, he rolled himself over, plugged into the amp directly adjacent to mine, turned up to 11, and proceeded to go to town on the guitar. A second time, I gave him the benefit of the doubt, walked away and tried a third amp without saying a word to him. He rolled over, plugged in, turned up and started playing as loud as he could. I asked him if he'd mind giving me a few moments as I was considering buying one of the amps and he responded with I don't know why you bother, you're a shitty guitarist and I can do anything you can do 10 times better. I looked him in the eye, said not quite anything and reached up to hang the guitar from the top rack which I had to stretch a bit to reach all while maintaining eye contact. Girlfriend had an iPod for like 3 years. It gets remotely locked one day, and she starts getting messages saying it was stolen. Turns out she bought it from a guy, who got it from a girl, who sold it for drugs. Wheel this girl's dad comes back from deployment and freaks out threatening my then 17 year old girlfriend for stealing this iPod. Now my girlfriend would have been totally cool with returning it, for her money back, but this guy is seriously irate. Threatening showing up at her house and everything, the address to which he got by using his Apple account because the iPod was still under his account. He's acting way overly violent and my girlfriend honestly feared for her safety because this guy was so intense. This went on for about a week before he really started scaring her. So my girlfriend does some digging and finds out how the iPod eventually ended up in her hands. Finds out his daughter sold it for drugs because she ran out of her parents money she could steal without being caught. Girlfriend tries to tell the father this who refuses to believe his daughter is anything but a complete angle. So they agree that my girlfriend will leave it at a worm at customer service desk and he will come pick it up later. What he picked up was an envelope with an iPod case and a letter in it. The letter telling him the actual iPod was out in the parking lot beneath a car and that he should find it before his run over. The iPod was in fact already destroyed and placed behind the tire of a sub in the Bob Evans next door. I was dating this girl. Thought she was the one. So I gave her the keys to my apartment. I worked late for my job. I was just happy there was someone in my bed when I got home at 2 in the morning. Came home one night and she was awake. She confessed to using my apartment to cheat on me with 7 different people. So I packed her stuff up. She was still living with her mom anyways. So I lied to her and said I moved to Seattle. I moved to Hawaii instead 3 months. After being in Hawaii I get a phone call from her. I answer and to my surprise she's called me from the Seattle airport. She flew out there to try and fix things between us. The dialogue goes as follows. Me. So you're in Seattle? Huh. Yeah. Weren't you listening? I came here to fix us. Me. Oh. Well that's bad. Huh, what's bad? Me, I'm in Hawaii, then hung up the phone. Phone rings I answer, huh, you lied to me. Me, huh, how does it feel? I hang up again. I don't know if that's petty, but to me was a good revenge. When my brother Daug was 12 he'd cycle to local supermarket with his buddies to shoplift chocolate bars on Saturday. This went on for a month, until they were hauled in by security. The stockroom manager Bob was married to our cousin and recognizing my bro volunteered to bring him home. 
On ride home my bro was seriously pleading with Bob not to tell my parents what had happened slash he'd never do it again, and he'd pay for the chocolate he'd learned his lesson yada rida. Bob drops my bro off and tells my mom everything. This was in mid-October, my bro got grounded for 6 weeks. Christmas rolls around, and we're in my aunt's house for extended family get-together. Mom gives Doug the presents to hand out. Doug says Auntie Susan, thanks for hosting, enjoy your gift, cousin. Kevin, awesome to see you, here's your present then he comes to Bob and says, shouting, you really think you'll get a gift? Faking rat bastards don't get anything. Me and siblings almost wet ourselves laughing, mom and dad wildly embarrassed. Doug got grounded for another month. I used to work at a pizzeria. There was this one customer that everyone hated. She was rude as hell, complained about everything, every single order she ever received, she found something to complain about. And she wasn't a normal customer, no, she would order essentially groceries from us by ordering disassembled sandwiches. For example she'd order a chicken sandwich, but with all of the ingredients separate, and in particular amounts, with cutlery, butter, a side of grated cheese, three plates, oil, and vine gar on the side, medium rare toasted bread, whatever the fact that means, extra packets of ranch. You get the idea. But because it was all technically part of a sandwich she didn't expect to be charged for any of the extras and would complain. She also refused to answer the door when delivery drivers got there and instead would leave the money in an envelope, exact change, no tip, under the doormat, and wanted the driver to leave the food on her doorstep. She also had weird specifications about where the driver could park, never in her driveway, only on the street, even when it was raining or she'd complain. Also, she didn't want them to announce their arrival in any way, no knocking, no ringing the bell, no beeping their car horns, they needed to be silent or she'd complain, faking nightmare, this woman. And every time she complained, she'd try to weasel some free sheet out of us for next time. Because of faking course she would. Anyway, one day she says she needs the driver to make change, and she wants him to just leave the change in the envelope, and not take a tip, because he gets paid already. So I tell my driver this, and he says oh I get paid, do I? No problem, I'll take care of it. He goes on the delivery, and comes back pleased as punch, doesn't say a word about how he took care of it. I get distracted, keep working, 10 minutes later I get a phone call. It's the crazy lady and she's furious, because apparently my driver left her the correct change of $5.85, in the envelope like she asked, in pennies faking genius. I had to put her on hold, so I could laugh. I get back on the phone with her, and I said ma'am, I think you'll find that pen is our legal tender. There's nothing I can do. After explaining that I am, indeed, the manager and the highest authority present, she got fed up and hung up on me. That driver is still a faking king to me. When me and my ex broke up, we were living together, but my name was not on the lease. I had paid for that month, and we agreed I would move out after that. I had known that our relationship was won its way out, so I wasn't all that torn up about the breakup at first. She went out of town until I moved out of the apartment. During that time I kept hanging out with people I had met through her, which apparently infuriated her to the point every time I would go hang out with that group of people, I would receive a text saying, did you have fun with blah and blah. This progressed to her telling me that I wasn't allowed to hang out with those people, and that if I, I was going to hang out with her friends, I had to at least respond to all her text messages, I would only respond if it was about our place. This went on for about two weeks, until she found out I had started to hang out with another girl that went to her school, and she told me that regardless of the fact I had paid for the month I had a week to get out of the apartment. I protested, but lost that argument to the her counter argument of, she broke girl code, you hurt me, contracts change. When it finally came time to for me to move out, and her to come to town, I decided to be petty, and take the toilet paper rolls out of the bathroom, and made sure, to not leave any at the house for her and her family. 
I used to be best friends with this girl that, whenever she met someone she'd practically forget about me, like she'd literally ignore me, like I didn't exist in a hoe. We went together on a trip and met a group of girls, and she obviously chose them over me and hung out with them all day, acting like they all were best friends or something, but as soon as they weren't around anymore she instantly started talking shit about them. One day she went to hang out with them as usual, and she forgot some camera at our hotel room. She kept bragging about it, because it was pretty expensive and had wifi, I don't know, who cares, and when I saw it on the bed I decided to hide it somewhere. An important detail I forgot to mention, is that we were sharing our room with two other girls we didn't know much they seemed nice though, but she hated them, and kept telling me that they were low class, and looked like thieves or something. Pretty sure she was just mad, because one of the first days we were trying swimsuits, and I got complimented by them, she on the other hand got told that she looked weird, because her legs were skinny, but she had a big belly. In a hoe, when she got back she obviously realized her camera was gone and started freaking out I pretended to help her look around for it, and just when I was about to tell her that I hid it as a joke the other girls came in the room and she immediately turned around and started yelling at them, she kept screaming that she knew they were thieves from the very first moment she saw them, and that she wanted her camera back obviously the other girls called her a snob and she stormed off and demanded we got other roommates because she refused to stay with poor low class people that steal. Anyway everything escalated quickly so when everyone was gone I grabbed the camera and put it somewhere else she could find it easily next day she had her camera back but the atmosphere in the room was heavy as fuck since everyone hated each other except for me my best friend thanked me for staying with her unlike her new friends who decided to go party instead of helping her look for camera and hung out with me the rest of the trip. This happened like 6 years ago. Never ever told her the truth, not even when I stopped hanging out with her. Once upon a time, I was a newly married lad. We purchased my grandparents house from their estate as our first home. We didn't have kids yet, so we both had full time jobs and hectic schedules. Incident, the first, one day, I came home from work, to find my dog out on her run, going nuts. She rarely barked, so I paused for a second, trying to find out what was going on, and watched as a bright yellow sprinkler came flying over the fence. There was a bunch of stuff lying about my backyard, where the neighbor kid, let's call him evil son, had been throwing it at my poor dog. I walked next door and banged on the neighbor's door. The boy's mother, let's call her Beach, came to the upstairs window, not even to the door, and yelled back quote what are you doing on my property, at me. By the way, this is my very first interaction with this woman. I introduced myself and tried to explain what was going on. She immediately jumped to back quote do you have video of my son throwing stuff? Then, inexplicably, Beach started blaming my wife and I. Backquote if we weren't such hermits, everyone wouldn't hate us so much. Ot, all of my other neighbors waved when we went by, but we didn't interact more than that. She was the only one I didn't know. Anyhow, she went on, and it turned out that she was upset that I didn't tell her that my grandmother had passed. Yeah, I hadn't told someone I didn't know about a family matter. Fine, whatever. I dropped the matter and left. Incident, the second, shortly thereafter, I stopped working a regular 9, 5, and started my own business, working out of my home. I noticed some mail went missing. One day, I see the mail truck go by, and put on shoes, to go pick it up from the mailbox. When I get down there, I find the box empty, and beach walking away from it with my sheet in hand. I yell at her, and she drops it in a pile on her driveway. Proceeds to yell at me that it was blowing around her driveway and that I should be more careful. Yeah, so I call the cops. They are reticent to do anything since I didn't actually see her take the mail from my mailbox, but they still go over to talk to her. I can hear her yelling at them from inside my house. The next day, she runs out and stands in front of my car, trying to confront me as I'm leaving. I tell her in no uncertain terms that I'm okay with running her over. Incident, the third, a neighbor's pet bunny went missing from its outdoor hutch. Another neighbor spots evil sundown at the end of our cul-de-sac, looking suspicious. Bunny is found, strangled, and mutilated, where evil sun was seen. Cops are called, denials, 
the works. Incident, the fourth, we were getting our house ready to sell. Part of that included stripping and repainting our attached deck. I come home from work, and find a can of paint has been opened and thrown across the deck, some furniture, and the side of the house. There are a few child-sized footprints through the paint. Cops come, but don't give a fuck. Incident, the fifth, evil son is expelled from his elementary school. He was found with a backquote kill list containing most of his classmates. This was not long after Columbine and similar incidents, so folks were sensitive about stuff like that. Incident, the sixth, beach has an backquote extinction burst, as they call it, blaming everyone for everything bad in her life. She puts flowers in everyone's mailboxes, talking about a conspiracy against her. Did you know that that's actually illegal and punishable by fine? She does now. Incident, the 7th, Beach takes a different neighbor to task, out in the street. Turns out, she doesn't have any friends, anymore. Other neighbors join the fracas, ganging up on her. Turns out her kid killing their rabbit, or her kid throwing rocks at their cars, and various other events, made her no friends. Incident, the 8th, Beach gets kicked out of a city alderman meeting, where she tried to have the entire neighborhood condemned for various imagined slights. Results. So, after years of dealing with this woman's bullshit, we prepared to move to a new house. We threw one last blowout party, as one does. I get a little inebriated and went on a rant about how little I was going to miss having that neighbor. A friend decided that payback was in order, so we went down into the cellar and perused my grandfather's shelves of stuff he never threw away. Amongst it all was a bottle of weed killer. Great Depression era, block letters, back quote weed killer. I have no idea what was in that stuff. Now, this is where the story gets a little hazy. My friend disappeared for about an hour and then was back, as if nothing ever happened. I never saw the bottle leave the shelf. But, a few days later, parts of Beach's lawn started to turn brown and die. Big block letters spelled out back quote I'm a beach. I ran into Beach a week later, as I was getting my mail. Contractors were tearing up her lawn, laying down rolls of sod. She stomped over to me and beached about my other neighbor's kids. She clearly saw them apply lighter fluid to her lawn and light it on fire to burn the awful message into it. Funny thing, whatever was done to her lawn, within a week sections of the new sod died and the message reappeared, although blobby and illegible. And I still have that yellow sprinkler fact that beach used to work with people who were tech illiterate, and one woman talked on her personal cell all day, while me and a coworker on her time, did all the work. We talked to all the bosses etc point and nothing was going to happen, she was in the in crowd. So one day I turned off her middle monitor, we used three, just so it'd be blank and that'd show her, point one one hour days are rough with someone who could help, but was too lazy, I wanted a petty victory. The next day I sheet you not four people were at her desk trying to get it to work. She started an hour before me. I chuckled and took my seat and got to work because it needed to get done by lunch. I finish our presentation, get it all set up before lunch and they are still at her desk. It's been six hours at this point. I figured there must be something big they are doing. I'll help. I walk over and the middle monitor is still off and they are talking with our in-house department and were at the point they replaced the cord and were going to order a new monitor. At this point I asked if it's turned on, they look at each then at me. Of course it is which is when I reach over and turn on the monitor and boom, it turns on and displays correctly. I was so disappointed, proud but disappointed. TLDR I turned off a co-worker's monitor and they couldn't fix it for 6 hours until I turned it back on. A few years ago I was on a stag weekend and was sharing a room with my mate. I know what he's like, so I was pretty suspicious of all of my belongings. The first morning, after many many beers the night before, so didn't remember to brush my teeth before passing out, I went to brush my teeth. I inspect my toothbrush. It's got some dark. Curly hairs embedded in it, not loads to be obvious, but definitely some that shouldn't be there. It also had a tinge of brown to the bristles. I knew exactly what he'd done, so I chucked that toothbrush into the bin and grabbed his and repeated the favor by giving my hole a good scrub, then cleaned the hairs off. I then brush my teeth as best I can using my finger and some toothpaste before exiting the bathroom. 
He didn't say anything, but the sheet-eating smirk I saw on his face confirmed everything I needed it to. I kept quiet and started to get changed as he entered the bathroom to wash his teeth. To this day, he has never mentioned it. He's presumably been sat there the last few years giggling away to himself at the thought of me brushing my mouth with his asshole ever, since whilst in the meantime, I'm the one laughing. When I was a teenager I made the stupid decision of letting this kid I knew borrow a good chunk of money. I had expected to be paid back the next day. He ignored my calls and texts, so I went to his workplace, where I also buy my coffee every day. After months of excuses about his house, mom, buddies, dogs all having to do with him not having the money, I'd finally had enough. I went to a family dollar, bought a jar of peanut butter, stopped at a cafe next door to grab a plastic knife and began exacting my revenge. I found his car behind his workplace, it was unlocked too. I spread peanut butter under all four door handles, inside and out, behind the window switches, behind his steering wheel shifter, volume knob, just about every possible surface I could think of that wasn't in direct line of sight. Just before the shop closed I took a walk downtown and snagged a discreet seat in perfect viewing distance of my perfect revenge. It was so sweet. I remember the excitement I felt when he first reached for his door handle and pulled his hand back in disgust. I couldn't see in his car very well, but I could see him flailing his arms about and I loved every second of it. He called me a little later on asking if I had anything to do with all the sticky sheet in his car and I responded, asking if he had anything to do with that money I was owed. I got my moolah a couple days later. TLDR was owed money by someone, so I spread peanut butter on all of the most inconvenient surfaces of their car. Northern United States. Snow on the ground. The dead of winter. Cowalker at the local shop is a consistent jackass. Said Kaorka also goes out for frequent smoke breaks, and, rather than standing in the cold outside the back door, likes to sit in their car. So one day, a different co-worker of mine comes into the shop with a cardboard box in their hands and a gigantic grin on their face. Long story short they have purchased two pounds. Now think about this two pounds of glitter. It came in several small clear plastic bags or within the cardboard box they were carrying. I'm sure I'm just remembering it this way, but I swear at one point somebody said I have a plan. Said co-worker with the gigantic grin manages to slip outside into the parking lot during the shift. They come back with an empty box. Fast forward to lunchtime. Said jackass Kaorka goes out to their car for a smoke. It hasn't been snowing, but it's cold enough that you can see your breath. So they getting in their car, and as the door closes, the engine comes to life. At my other cowalker's insistence, several of us have gathered by the break room window to observe this occasion. What happened next I can only describe as a literally screaming snow globe. The howling that came out of that car, as all of the glitter came shooting out of the dashboard air vents, we are filled with surprise, panic, denial and eventually anger. For about 3 seconds the front windshield of their car looked very similar to the effect of stirring metallic paint, only vertical and multicolored. Yes. No exaggeration. No BS. Years later, they would come into the shop, and, I'm told as I no longer work there, from time to time you can see a piece of glitter stuck to their backside, or their hair, their hands, their boots, pretty much anything that would have come in contact with the interior of that car. Several of my friends still will not let said co-worker drive them anywhere, as they are afraid to get fairy herpes from the car. I used to make stupid YouTube videos with this girl for fun. She ended up taking it way too seriously and lost her sheet at me when I had to cancel our plans to make a video one day. I decided to stop hanging out with her even after she apologized trying to escape repeating toxic relationships and whatnot. And this girl was toxic. When I cancelled our plans she gaslighted me and guilt tripped me, saying things like, I hang out when I don't really want to why can't you just suck it up and do one thing for me, I digress. She kept our YouTube channel. So I deleted her from FB when I ended our friendship, but I never blocked her. A few months later I deleted all of my social media for a break. A day later she makes a YouTube video sheet talking me, using my real name calling me a beach and an idiot and a loser for blocking her on social media. I remembered that I still 
had the password for the Gmail account we used for the channel, so I logged into YouTube, deleted the entire channel, and then for good measure I changed all of the passwords and security questions a bunch of times, and then deleted the Gmail account entirely, so she couldn't even recover her YouTube channel. I'm not sure if this is petty revenge or pro revenge. Also, this one happened to me. In high school, there was a guy called Sandy that was a friend of someone in my circle of friends. I did not like this guy, because because he was kind of awkward, but he was tolerated by my other friends. This guy did not have a mean bone in his body, but he was so awkward that he made me uncomfortable, and I always treated him like shit. In university I had to fly to a funeral. Someone very close to me had died, and the funeral was in her hometown. I was depressed and not thinking clearly and was pretty much on autopilot for a few weeks. So, when I got back from the funeral I was stuck at the airport with nobody to pick me up and no way to get back to school, which was a 2 hour drive away. I called everybody. When I finally got a hold of one of my friends he said he couldn't do it, but maybe Sandy could. Sure enough, Sandy dropped what he was doing, picked me up and drove me back to school. On the way, we talked a little. He was the only person I knew, not family, not friends, that managed to say something that was a little comforting. Family and friends tried, but only Sandy had the words and feelings that made me feel a little better. It was then that I realized I had been a huge dick to this guy who had never done anything to me. This has led me to a lifetime of guilty feelings about how I treated him in high school. To top it off, at the end of the ride, I offered him money for gas and he wouldn't take it. I doubt he had any intention of getting revenge for how I treated him, but Sandy sure taught me a lesson. I was working as a retail sales rep for Comcast. One day this guy and his wife comes in requesting to switch service to her name so they can get better pricing. I look up the location and they've been switching back and forth for the past 6 years. Not a problem. As a rep I'm not allowed to explicitly tell customers to do this, but if they ask I can't deny them. So I go over the procedure with him. In order to do the switch the old account has to be closed clean. That means the equipment needs to be returned and the final balance paid. Normally I'll let the equipment slide as long as they return it within a week, but the final bill needs to be paid before the switch. There's no exceptions. He throws a fit. The bill is about $200, but he's disputing half of it. I'll pay you $100 and thaps it yeah no, this is not a negotiation. $200 or no switch, you can dispute the transaction later. I explained to him that this is our policy for account switches, and if I do what he's asking I'll get in a lot of trouble. I outright tell him you're asking me to do something that will get me fired he doesn't care, he insists I take the $100. Finally after 15 minutes more of wasting my time he gives up and yells fine. He'll call in and put it under my son Robert's name. The moment he leaves I notate his account customer wants new account in son Robert's name. Refuses to pay final bill. Do not restart service until bill paid in full and equipment returned dude came back a few days later tail between his legs with a bunch of DVRs, the old heavy ones, and paid the bill in full to restart service. There was this kid in my science class my freshman year of high school that hated me let's call him jerk face. I had no idea what I did to him to make him call me names like Satan I kid you not, but I apparently did something. Instead of desks in this classroom, we had these big black tables that sat two people. Part way through the year, our teacher arranged them so two tables were paired together, two people on each side facing each other. You could see all of the work the people across from you were doing. Guess who ended up sitting across from me and my best friend, jerk face. One day the teacher gave us a quiz we were allowed to complete with a partner, singular not partners. About two questions into it, I saw from the corner of my eye that jerk face was glancing at our paper and writing down the same answers. I nudged my friend under the table, gave her the old look over their eye roll, and one of those silent conversations only childhood best friends know how to have with just their eyes took place. Are you seeing this? Yes. What a dick. You know what to do, right? Right. We then proceeded to answer every question wrong. He got up to turn in his and his partner's quiz while we quickly erased everything and wrote out the correct answers. 
The look on his face when we got our scores back is still satisfying to this very day. Had a girl who would constantly try to ruin my reputation at school by saying I was a hoe behind my back while I thought we were friends. I just cut her out and let her talk smack until one day I snapped because she invited my long term boyfriend, a little less than 2 years, over to her house while him and I were in a petty argument. I faking lost it. Told the boy to go fuck himself and all that then cut him out of my life. Keep in mind, she had been feeding him lies about me causing us to fight. A few months later I remembered that she was deeply in love with this guy named Jack, not his real name yeah no, she would always talk about him and say how he was the one yada yada. I somehow remembered his Instagram name and decided to follow him and like a few pics to see if he'd DM me. Sure enough he did and we met later that day. A few weeks later we decided to make it official and go on a formal date then post our announcement on Facebook. Oh boy how this girl had a faking mental breakdown. Threatening to kill herself and all that. Did I care? Fuck no. Karma's a beach and she deserved it. We are about to make 6 months in December and I couldn't be happier. I'm glad I made that petty decision because it opened a window to a beautiful opportunity. Damn 7k plus comments. I hope someone sees this because I'm proud of it. My ex, many moons ago, was a faking idiot. She knew, knew, that I had many friends that lived in the same neighborhood as her ex, that she had left a couple months before dating me. She always told me she was going over a girlfriend's house to study, and I had no reason not to believe her. Till one day she wouldn't answer a single text. Now I'm not the kind of guy to text a billion times. I'll text you, then if you don't reply, maybe I'll text you too. Three hours later, to make sure you got my last message, and if you still don't answer, then, man, I'll talk to you, when you feel, like you want to talk. So anyway, I'm at my friend's house later, that night having not gotten a reply from her, since maybe 12 hours ago. Me and the group of friends decide to go outside in his backyard to make a pit fire, when I notice her car in the driveway of the house behind us. I didn't know it was her ex's house, but it was the weird I wrong neighborhood for her girlfriend's house. I call her sister up and say where is your sister and she says oh she's at girl's name's house. Well I'm going faking nuts then because I'm looking at her car now and this isn't girl's name s neighborhood. Her response to that was uh. So I hang up and ask my friend who lives in the house we were all hanging out at who owns the house behind him. Oh that's her ex-boyfriend's name s house. I called her phone to find it was off. So I just chilled the rest of my time there and paid it no more attention. No sense in worrying at this point it's a done deal. About 2 hours later I get a call from her saying the phone was on silent for study purposes and if I wanted to come over. Sure I told her. I arrive at the house a little bit after and she hops in the car and as soon as she shuts the door I ask how was studying with girlfriend's name and she gives me some bullshit answer like I didn't know. After she's done spewing her lie I say weird. Must have been a long walk from ex-boyfriend's house. I made sure to look at her face as I said it so that I could see any expression. She knew I knew but wouldn't let it go. It will go quicker if I just give you the dialogue. We were just talking things out why would it be okay to just go over there to do that if you have a boyfriend? Talk things out? What needs to be talked out? We've been friends for a very long time before dating. I can't just stop talking to him. So to get around that, you feel it's logical to lie to me about going to girlfriend's house. It's 11pm, you've been talking it out since 10am. I've tried getting a hold of you a couple times too. Silence for a bit. So what did you guys do? She wouldn't answer or look at me. I told her to get out of the car and just pulled off. She broke up with him the first time because he was physically abusive. And about a year after I drove off she calls me asking if we could try to make it work again and if I'd like to get together over dinner. So I said yes and arranged a date at a fairly upscale place for Saturday at 8pm. Told her the dress code and all since it was a snazzy joint. I'm not sure how long she sat there because I didn't faking go. I once was good friends with two women who were friends with each other. Call them Kate and Jane. Kate and I had a falling out with Jane. Over what? We don't know. 
she suddenly became antisocial, cruel, and vicious. The evening of the big fallout, we all had agreed to hang out late in the evening. I go to Jane's apartment and knock, no answer. Kid shows up, I tell her Jane isn't answering the door. She says she's probably got those damn headphones on again. I'll knock on the window. So she does. Jane comes to the door screaming at us. Why did we wake her up? Did we know what time it was? How hard it was for her to sleep? We were shocked. We reminded her we'd all agreed to meet at 11. I'd spoken to her not 3 hours before, and she said she was excited. She kept berating us. We finally told her it was fine if she didn't want to hang out with us, but she should have sent us a text or something when she changed her mind and we wouldn't have bothered her and she should go back inside. Kate and I went across the courtyard to my apartment, Jane and I are neighbors, and sat outside drinking and smoking and talking. Much of the talk centered around how much Jane had changed, how rude and mean she'd been, and how we were sick of her sheet and having to constantly maneuver around her easily bruised ego. Kate was pretty drunk, so she sent for an Uber to get home, but she also needed to pee really badly. I told her to use my bathroom, but I had a large pit bull at the time, R.I.P. Cooper, and she was scared of him. So she decided to pop a squat outside. But being drunk and still pissed at Jane, she also decided to take her revenge. She walked across the courtyard, yanked down her pants, and pissed all over Jane's welcome mat, stoop, and door laughing hysterically the whole time. I just sat there dumbfounded. Kate pulled her pants up and said that's what I think of her now. The Uber came, she left, and it was never mentioned again. Freshman year of college, when I got paired up with four girls to do a group assignment that regularly sat together and did nothing but gossip, I was pretty much 100% faking done with group projects and refused to ever do them again. These four girls did nothing for the six weeks we had to work on the project, and while I did my part one wanted to really fack them over with it. I stayed up the two nights before it was due working on it turning a 15 slide assignment that was supposed to be brief and well summarized into a 60 slide monster. When it came time for us to present I had let the girls know I did the slides and that I'd present first and then they could just read off them. They were 100% super thankful and happy about this which just made me even more mad. I loaded up the powerpoint did my 6 slides, which contained all of the information needed for our portion of the assignment, and then let them just go on and on and on not realizing they were repeating sheet every other slide, talking over information not relevant at all to the project, and the struggle of them clicking next, and never getting to the last slide. I watched those beaches burn, and it was glorious. My professor ended up asking me after class what the hell was going on, and when I explained she told me she'd evaluate what was done and get back to me. I got an A for the assignment and the girls would give me glares the rest of the semester and I'd just flip them off still pissed, I don't know what they got for a grade, or if they had to repeat it fact those girls, fact group projects. Super late to this, but hopefully someone gets to enjoy this story. I went to a huge Oktoberfest celebration, and as is tradition, there wasn't enough outhouses for the size of the crowd. Many lines being 10, 15 people long. Well, as we all know, hours of drinking means it's all gotta go somewhere. So a couple people in my group all go, and stand in line in the same time. Lines are moving decently well, but lines of 10, 15 people with a full bladder is still a long time, no matter how many times you hop up and down. Well, we get to the point where we are almost next and this one girl, you know the kind that is just hot enough to get by on her looks, but not hot enough to really make money off her looks, starts kinda doing this cute as he walk up sideways perpendicular to the lines. She tries flirting with the guy in front of us who promptly told her the back of the line was way over there. She gets all pussy and complains to her boyfriend who had walked up. One of the outhouses opens up she dashes, in saying sorry not sorry. Well, there was an anger built up from the discomfort of a full bladder and waiting 20 minutes for some girl to just cut and expecting special treatment, so my buddies and I started chanting what a beach, what a beach, at the top of our lungs. A decent amount of other people who saw what happened joined in until she exited the outhouse where there were quite a bunch of fakiaus apostrophe exchanged back and forth. Well, 
her boyfriend keeps trying to encourage her to leave and let it be since the angry drunk crowd was starting to turn and he didn't want to get dragged into where he was going to have to defend her, but she refused to let it go. That was until she got struck by a sopping wet ball of paper towels or toilet paper that came from the direction of the outhouses. Everyone was pretty shocked as she let out a blood curdling scream over it. I actually felt bad for her for a few seconds. We were all pissed for being forced to wait, but I didn't think it warranted a presumably pus soaked ball of paper towels to the head. I was a teller at a bank. My main job was to refer clients to bankers, salespeople, and their job was to close a sale. I was previously a banker at a different institution, and so I knew the entire process inside out and led the bank in referrals and referred sales company wide. There was a new banker who was particularly rude to me. Why was she so rude? I think she was just a bad person and only showed people respect when she thought it would benefit her. Anyhow, I stopped by her office to check on a big referral. She told me I don't belong in her office and if she wants to update me on a sale she would do so. This meant she blew the sale she was not only new but had little experience and was terrible at her job. It wasn't out of the ordinary for her to act like this but was particularly rude because I was honestly wondering what the outcome was for our client. I shrugged, walked out, and never sent her a client again. It didn't matter if the other bankers had their entire week booked with meetings and someone came in looking for an appointment as soon as possible she wasn't getting any more business. This wasn't at the client's expense because as I said, this banker was terrible at her job and I could see the look of confusion and disappoint as client after client walked out of her office empty handed never to return. She couldn't figure out how to create business from herself and so without my referrals she posted absolutely no sales indefinitely and eventually had a nervous breakdown from stress and quit. The other bankers, however, did quite well with the extra opportunities I gave them. I once lived with two roommates, one of which who bullied me, she'd give me the silent treatment, comment on my weight pretending she didn't know I was around, listen to TV music on blast while I was sleeping on her days off, tried to get one of my boyfriends to sleep with her and spread rumors about him when he didn't and never paid me in time for any of our bills, among other things, while we lived together. It got so bad for me that I would cry on my way commute home. Too broke to move, and too anxious to spend another night in that apartment. She worked at 9, 5, while I worked nights. When I finally was able to move out I crafted my revenge. Her bedroom door had no lock. The morning I moved was a weekday and she worked I got several shrimp and taped a few to the inside of the air vents in her room. With some help, we lifted her bed and I removed the foot pads of her metal tubing bed frame and put several shrimp in before closing them back up. Lastly, my, then, boyfriend surprised me with a box with some moth larvae. She was terrified of moths. After she spread rumors about him, I'm not surprised he wanted to get revenge also. He placed them in her closet, hidden in some sweaters. Petty? You bet. But after trying to fix our relationship several times, and over a year of stress, I don't regret it one bit. Years later, I saw our other roommate. Upon catching up. He told me you picked a great time to move out. Shortly after you left we were dealing with this crazy moth infestation. I had transferred to a very small private school my junior year of high school. Not my choice, but my parents moved to a rough area and my mother worked a second job to keep me in there because the public school was known to have low graduation rates compared to other public schools in the neighboring cities. For that, I'm forever grateful. I had gone from being somewhat cool to the new kid without friends. It lent a lot of perspective and empathy, and from it, I learned a sense of compassion for anyone being the noob in a class or job scenario as I became an adult. Anyway, transferring I. I sat in the hallway outside the principal's office as the administrative work was being taken care of. Across from me was John, without the H who was awaiting discipline for something, though I'm not entirely sure. He looked me up and said, what the fuck are you looking at? Being a former cool kid, I laughed under my breath, rolled my eyes, and shrugged it off. That did not go well with him. He told me to go fuck myself, and he'd see me later, just before he went into the office, to receive whatever discipline he was there for. 
Throughout my junior year, I'd be called names, shoulder checked, even spit at by John. I eventually made friends at the school, so it was tolerable. I always kept my cool. Being a small school, we also were on the baseball team together. I was somewhat of a standout and was awarded captain of the team and on the field John and I had a mutual respect and common goal of winning. However, towards the end of the season he broke that mutual respect by taking a piss in my baseball bag, soaking my helmet and glove with piss. It has always smelled like piss since. I never ratted him out because it just wasn't my thing. I don't discount others for doing it, especially in a bullying or dangerous situation, but it just wasn't for me. But, I was at the point where I had had enough. I was going to get him back. He had a class in a period before mine. We had the same desk, and he'd often leave me notes that said, fuck you on them. Looking back, I now think it's kind of funny. But he had made the mistake of leaving a graded test behind one Friday. He had a D, so I know it wasn't a token for him to show his parents. I took it and devised my plan for revenge. I wrote on the back senior. Prank ideas. Listed a bunch of preposterous ideas like cow on top floor, set off sprinklers, call in 100 pizzas and finally throw a mattress in the pool among others. I did my best to mimic his writing. The following weekend, I had drove around town, found a mattress at the side of the road, hopped the fence of the neighboring K the 8th grade campus, and dragged the mattress with a senior zero to spray painted on it over the fence and into the pool. The thing about throwing a mattress into a pool is, once it's soaked, it absorbs ton of water and becomes very difficult to pull out from the deep end. The school had to rent a bobcat to pull it out. It's nagged and dripped, and bunch of foam and debris littered the pool and the school had to drain and clean the pool and fill it again. Needless to say, it was an expensive fix. The following Monday, I had left his test behind, as if it had been there all weekend. Somebody in or another class had turned it into the teacher, who then turned it into the principal. John was soon after expelled because it would have been his third strike at the school. They couldn't simply suspend him this time. So he left the school and finished the last two months of the semester at another school and graduated. From what I heard, his parents didn't even believe him when he was questioned and denied doing it. I had a bit of guilt at the time because I was worried I may have set him on course for disaster in life. But through Facebook, I eventually saw he took over his father's successful plumbing business and is doing okay, so I don't feel as much guilt as I used. I acknowledge how I what I did for revenge was faked up and could have been disastrous for him. But he rebounded in life just fine. I just hope that he learned he can't get away with pulling his sheet every time, that there is always some force keeping tabs, and he treats others with a little more respect. I'm sure karma will get me back someday, but in the immortal words of Daniel Cormier, fuck John. Victim of one. I ordered pizza and a diet Pepsi, because I was working on a house we just bought, and we didn't have any furniture, let alone a fridge and stove. I get back to work and lose track of the time. Just as I remember the pizza is taking too long, the doorbell rings. I look at my phone and it's been over an hour, easy. The guy hands me the stuff, and I tip my usual $5, that which is over 20% of what I paid. I don't know who's at fault for the late delivery, and I'm tired and hungry. I plop down on my paint bucket chair and paint bucket table, to partake in my only meal of the day. It's burned. The pepperoni are charred, and the cheese is yellow. I grab my cup to pour myself a tall frosty diet Pepsi, it's brisk iced tea or some iced tea, which I don't care for. I call the store and the manager is unavailable. I instead tell the guy that answered what happened. He looks up my order, and then comes back with a very apathetic sorry. I tell him the scenario about me just moving in, and how I'm covered in paint and world have picked up the pizza otherwise. There's a brief pause and he says, oh, you're not Melinda and Mary O, insert last name and address? No, I don't know anyone by that name, but that's the right address. Oh, so they don't live there? No, we just bought the place a few weeks ago, and I'm the only one here. Oh, cause they didn't want to pay, or tip the driver a few times, so they kind of owe us. Yeah, well that's not me, and you guys really messed up my order. I can send you pictures, and there's no way I cold messed with it, because I don't even have any furniture in here. To which he said, no, I believe you. 
Let me see who can I get out there and get you another order. I got the order in 25 minutes with the correct drink. I talked to the driver and she said the previous people were rude and never tipped. She said they probably thought you were them. When I was in high school we lived near the dump. So we'd take the trash cans in the back of my truck to the dump ourselves instead of paying for trash collections. One time my dad decided to take my truck before I got up and go to the dump. I don't know why, I just would have gone to the dump myself when I got up, but whatever. He left the trash cans in my truck so, when he came in I said hey dad, you left the trash cans in my truck. I know. And he walked off. I didn't have to work that weekend, so Saturday goes by, the trash cans are still in there. Sunday morning, hey dad, you left the trash cans in my truck. I know. Again, no apology, no questions, no reasons, nothing. I went to church with my mom and her car, came home and the trash cans are still there. Dad, you want to get the trash cans out of my truck? I don't plan on taking them to school with me. Nope. And he left them. The next morning I wake up and the trash cans are still in my truck bed. I take the trash cans out of my truck, past the place where they belong, and put them in the way back of my father's station wagon. He did sometimes take the trash to the dump in his own car. I went to school, and to this day we have never spoken a single word about it. I wish I'd seen his face when he went to work that afternoon, but I'll never know how he reacted. A couple decades ago I was renting a house in the Seattle area and my landlord was a real shitty property management company. I had a lot of arguments with them, but when I moved out and cleaned the whole house and nothing had been damaged. Regardless, they decided to keep my $850 deposit, plus they had the gall to say I owed them an additional $10 for cleaning costs. Right at the time I was a victim of a violent crime and I had to move for reasons related to that. I didn't have the time or energy to argue with them about the $860 dollars, and I'd been hospitalized. Feeling beleaguered, I took the first apartment I could afford, and it had cockroaches. I hadn't noticed them when I was looking at the place, but after I moved and I saw them, I felt devastated, so many bad things piling up on me. That's when I got an idea. I started to catch the cockroaches in a jar and save them. After about a week I had a good number of live cockroaches in my jar, so I drove down to the property management office to pay the $10. In the lobby the secretary asked what I needed, and I replied that I thought I owed them some money, but wasn't sure how much. The secretary got up and left the lobby to find my file, leaving me totally alone. At that point I opened my backpack and took out the jar of roaches, opened it and let them scurry away. Within seconds they has disappeared under floorboards and furniture. A moment later the secretary came out and said, Oh yes, you owe us $10. I paid them and left with a big smile on my face. Petty revenge? Yes. Do I feel guilty? No. Oh oh I got one. I dated a girl a while back for a bit and we decided we wanted to go see a concert that we both would have enjoyed. The concert was about 6 months out from the date the tickets went on sale, but I bought some for us anyway. I figured it would be smoothish sailing until the concert, because everything was going well between the two of us anyway so I figured, eff it why not? At $100 a ticket I think it would be a fun event to go to in the future, and gave us something to look forward to. So I bought the physical tickets, and when they came in I gave them to her for a birthday present. At this point the concert was only a couple months out no biggie right. Wrong. As you may have guessed the relationship didn't work out so well. We shall say mutual differences occurred. Well she started giving stuff back that I gifted her over time, but never gave me the concert tickets back fact. Thinking I was sheet out of luck I was about to count those off as a loss and get over it when I decided to call Ticketmaster and see what happens to tickets that are lost or stolen as it so happens. As long as you have the same credit card and an ID you used to purchase said tickets they can automatically issue you new ones. So what happens to the old ones? They become invalidated but the person won't know that unless they attempt to go to the concert with them. I think you see where this is going. Now since I was pretty aff I called her up and explicitly asked about the tickets. Hyper petty I know, but nonetheless she ignored the question did not even say something like, 
Fuck you I'm not giving those back just simply pretended not to hear me. Well I had already issued new tickets which had she said something to me, I would have let her know that, but she didn't want to make amends about it so fuck her. I brought my best friend at the time to the concert. The show was great. Fantastic even. No, fuck you text messages, no illicit facebook posts. Nothing. I figured she sucked it up and didn't go, because imagine the embarrassed feeling you get going to a concert assuming with someone else, because you had two tickets, only to be told at the gate that your tickets don't work because they were flagged for being stolen. Awkward. Now I have to preface this by saying, my tickets were in a really inconvenient to get to location in the arena. Meaning that people in the section we were in really had to go out of your way to get to this section. Basically one concourse in or out of the nosebleed section of the arena. If you are going to meet someone chances are good the only reason you'd see them is if they deliberately came to your section. Nearing the end of the concert the band walks off and just before they came back on for their encore I kept getting this really uncomfortable feeling someone was watching me. So I look over out of the corner of my eye toward the concourse and I see a figure of a woman walking down the hallway. No. Way. She. Was. There. Right. Anyway I ignore this odd feeling, because who would, after being embarrassed at the entrance to the concert go and scalp, because the show was sold out, another ticket just to come up to the section you were supposed to have seats in just to see if your ex was actually using the tickets? Crazy right? Yeah I thought so too. Welp turns out, she really did buy another ticket. Mind you she brought her friend to the concert, to go to the concert, but because I reissued tickets they would have had to scalp two tickets, but she didn't. TLDR ticket master will reissue new tickets, if your sheet bag ex won't even talk to you about them. This is gonna be a lengthy one, sorry in advance. Back in junior year of high school I was sent to EEP, it's technically out of school suspension in an alternative school, and I ended up meeting a super cool chick and we became fast friends. I decided to take a sick day, and received a text from her saying that some dude was just sent there, and started getting a little creepy. Nothing too bad, just sat next to her, and wouldn't shut up. All she wanted me to do, was sit by her, and act kinda sweet on her, so he'd get the message and leave her alone. Flash forward to the last period of the next day. I went into class, and sat next next to my friend, and purposefully got a little comfy with her. This dude comes in, and sits next to me. He was at least 6 feet 2 and pretty fucking shredded. I'm only like 5 feet 7 lol. He chatted me up for a bit, and I decided he was annoying, but not too bad. Teacher passed us our work, and everyone gets quiet. Everyone, except for this faker. He keeps going on and on about nonsensical bullshit and is progressively getting louder and louder. He's told to shut up by the teacher and other students multiple times, but just keeps going. He eventually made some snide comment about my female friend, so I decided to fuck his day up. I began by making small comments and started instigating him into doing something stupid. Eventually, ignorance won out. He threw a book across the room, got up, and came over to my desk. He was almost screaming at this point, and I started laughing uncontrollably. Balls up his fist to hit me, so the teacher comes to intervene. The teacher was like 6 feet 4, and had another 100 pounds of fatness against this guy. He grabbed him, and took him into the office. But it doesn't end there. In Eep, leaving school is much the same as kindergarten. They call your names, and you don't leave your seat to leave until you're called. My friend thanks me, and leaves. My name is called, so I get up and walk out. The office was surrounded in plexiglass, and was positioned directly to the right of the entrance slash exit. I walked by, and happened to see Sheet 4 Brain sitting in a chair with a serious scowl on his face. He looks up, and mouthed something to me, that I couldn't hear. I flipped him off with both hands, and sauntered out into my mum's car. This guy hauled Daz out of the school, screaming about how he was gonna fuck Myers up, and ended up getting into a fight with the police that ran out to stop him. I asked later, and he was banned from the entire district and sent to juvie for several months. All for being an idiot. Not especially proud of it, but I certainly got results. I was in an FB fan group for a video game. The admin was a beach. She thought everyone loved her, because everyone joined the group, the game was extremely popular. 
She annoyed me, but the group for the most part was run rather well. Eventually, some people started complaining about swearing. They said their kids use the group and they didn't want their kids seeing such language. So a rule was added that prohibited foul language. By this point, the admin has a circle of people who worship the ground she walks on. These people often tiptoe over the edge of the rules, and she ignores it. A new girl enters this circle. She hates the no profanity rule, and constantly ignores it. Every other word in her post is some sort of profanity. The admin ignores it as per usual for one of her circle of sycophants. My friend ends up posting something, and in the middle of a few paragraphs wrote the word damn once. Admin goes around in a comment about how she is tired of people breaking the rules and bans my friend. Sycophant quickly responds in the comments cussing out my friend. I decide that I'm going to do something. That particular girl is getting banned from the group. I quickly decided the admin's ego would be the best target to use for my goal. I make up a bunch of photoshopped messages that look that they're from that girl. I made sure pixel by pixel everything looked right. The messages were all threatening and beachy, with some rather crude remarks about the admin throughout the whole thing. I sent them to the admin pretending to be a member of the group the girl sent those messages to because I said something to her about watching her language, because I didn't like profanity in a group where kids might be present. She barely seemed to buy it, so I was worried there would be little fallout. The admin posted a huge post in group about how she felt betrayed from the girl, and how that kind of talking behind her back was a bannable offense. The admin banned her. I ended up leaving the group. After I got into an argument with the admin about a new rule prohibiting mentioning any other games besides the game of the group in a good light, I still got my petty revenge and laugh about it to this day. Background. We had a warehouse that would get an influx of inbound trailers each morning, then would shut down at night. Employees arrived about 30 minutes before the trucks started rolling in. We had a warehouse worker that was an extreme hothead. He just went nuclear over every little thing. He had forgotten to clock back in after his break, so his check was 2 hours short. He went to the payroll girl and she saw the error and told him it would be corrected and that he would get the 2 hours pay on his next check. He blew up and basically said fuck you and fuck this company. I quit and threw his badge at her and walked out. Late that night, he came back to the warehouse, we had him on camera, and cut the wires to the electronic gate, and filled the manual lock with a compound like JB Weld, can't be removed. Employees showed up the next morning, and couldn't get in. They called maintenance, and they guys, couldn't get inside to get tools, because there is barbed wire on the fence. Some people left to get their personal tools, and came back about 45 minutes later. By that time, trucks were backed up down the street. It took about 30 minutes to get the gate open and people scrambled in to get the business going. They have a vacuum tube for drivers to send in their paperwork, like you see at bank drive thrust. The dispatcher that receives the paperwork and tells the driver what dock door to go to gets inside and scrambles to get everything ready. The trucks came in, but the dispatcher couldn't send the tube carrier thing through and the vacuum system burned out. We later discovered that he had cut the barbed wire on the back of the warehouse fence and poured an 80 pound bag of quickcrete into the tube, then poured water in. So the tube was blocked with concrete. So they had employees running to all of the trucks to get paperwork. All said and done, he caused about $15k in damage and put the operation about 4 hours behind. In the lawsuit, he ended up being on the hock for about $25k, all because of 2 hours pay, being delayed by a week due to his own mistake. He probably made about $18 hour, so about $36. Probably not his wisest decision. But if he wanted to cause disruption, he certainly accomplished that. Long post, short version below, few years back. I was working for a video store back when those were still a thing. I was close with my coworkers and my supervisors. We all hung out when out not working, and it was great. We would all hang out after close waiting for the others to get off to hang out. One day my shift leader Bob, real name because Bob is my homeboy and I jaff, got dumped by his trashy ex. We all hated her and thought it was a blessing she was gone and wouldn't be around. The downside was Bob did not take the breakup well. 
he became an uber dickhead constantly and made our lives hell because he wasn't happy. We all felt for him, but enough was enough. I had decided that if Bob was gone or stayed pissed at us for nothing I should at least give him a reason. It was a Friday night and a little before closing I went to the safe and exchanged every dollar from all of the tills with rolled coins. Then because that wasn't the plan I unwrapped every roll. My coworkers thought it was funny as hell, so we all took our heaviest fact tills to the office for him to do the final count for the night and quickly ran back up front to let the drama ensue. It was a perfect storm. Bob walks to the office as we all watch with pregnant silence. Less than a minute later we hear the cursing started. We all bust up. Bob is broiling angry and storms out of the office and begins to curse at all of us. I man up and tell him it was me. Bob sidearms a DVD and it barely misses my head. I'm in tears because I'm laughing so hard. We help him finish the count and we all head out. Bob refuses to talk to me for about a week and apologizes finally about trying to ninja star me with a DVD case. I told him that my thought process was to get him so pissed that he would finally get over his post breakup hump. I actually was thanked by him. Petty acts can be used for the greater good. TLDR. Friend got dumped. Became a dickhead. Purposely faked with him to push him over the edge. Overblown anger allowed him to get over everything. Got thanked. Ultimate as in the best, I'm a notorious office prankster. One day just for fun, I ran a network cable into the ceiling of a co-worker's office. I work in it and occasionally have to run cables for security cameras and wireless access points, so this raised zero suspicion. And then while he was gone, I zip-tied his desk phone to one of the beams holding the drop tile ceiling, plugged it into the aforementioned wire, and then kept calling it once he got back. So it was continuously ringing while suspended about 10 feet above his head. In turn, he went to a few sites where doctors slash lawyers slash etc point can get free magazine subscriptions for their lobbies and waiting rooms and signed me up for every subscription he could find. For nearly a year I was getting magazines such as Teen Vogue, People and Espinal, Martha Stewart Living, Texas Monthly, etc. In addition, since these were for businesses, they all were addressed to Pancake, proctology specialist he was calling me a bad doctor. All these magazines were pissing me off. I had no idea where they were coming from, and I couldn't get them to stop either, even after spending hours calling the companies trying to cancel the subscriptions. I didn't even realize he caused them until like a year later, when he finally admitted it. And of course I didn't learn my lesson from all this either. In high school in the mid 90s, when pages were still a thing, I had a genius buddy who was sort of mad scientist. We both did a lot of programming, and he and I had a lot of fun with computers. He wrote a program called a war dialer, yes, like in the movie War Games. His version would not only dial around town looking for modems to talk to, it would also find strings of pager numbers to use for a nasty prank called a pager bomb. He would take random pager numbers out of the want ads and use the war dialer to find out how many numbers in that same exchange were part of the block leased by the pager company. He would find these large blocks of hundreds, even thousands of pages. Then whenever someone pissed him off, he would set his war dialer to dial every number in that block of pages and page every user in that block of numbers to the phone number of the house where the kid that pissed him off lived. Each of the pager users would get one random wrong number, while the target would get hundreds of random I just got paged to this number phone calls. Basically a human powered DDoS attack on the target's home phone. One guy that picked on him in school got bombed so bad, his mom unplugged the phone from the wall because it wouldn't stop ringing overnight. She plugged it back in the next day still ringing. Shut down their phone for 3 days. They called the phone company, but my friend had set up a wireless transmitter tapped into a payphone nearby. He used the electronics to send the pulse codes that activate the payphone so that he could make free and traceable calls, so the phone company never figured out who it was. Did I mention the guy is a genius? Currently in it right now. Sil is being evicted from their house by my now ex step Phil because they were being as holes. Called him a slumlord for not dropping everything to fix a heater in their house. He also runs a business and the issue was the stove was getting too warm. They cold opened a window and been fine. No fire hazard or anything. 
So dramatic Sil goes to her grandparents with a sob story and they buy them a new dollar sign 2k heater stove. Now that SFIL is divorcing Mill, because of Sil giving an ultimatum to Mill of it's your grandchild or your husband, he's moving into his old house, which he's been renting to us for several years. So now we are being moved into Beach Sil's home, and they are moving in with her mom, and taking her house. Mill is moving to a shop she owns, and will be living in a freaking pet boarding shop. Of course Sil makes it, so she's the victim. Because they are being evicted, but apparently my husband and I are just changing houses. The cognitive dissonance is astounding. It's literally insane. She's the queen of petty. So she's taking that stove that grandparents bought them, even though it means we'll be out of stove. Same with several appliances, even though her mom's house is fully furnished, and they will just be storing their sheet in a tent in the yard. So yeah. Taking a heating unit from a house that you had bought for you just to spite the landlord, even though it facts over your little brother and his wife, and then telling them they should be grateful for the upgrade of a house when they're still being forced to move in two weeks during the faking Alaskan winter. Oh yeah, and we can't move till they are out, and they are taking their sweet time, because they have a bar be congratulations you fulfilled your evolutionary purpose. Sorry for the rant, I'm still pretty faking pissed about all this. Actually had a dream the other night that I taught my Sil a new one and she even acted like an attacked victim in the dream. Such a manipulative beach and her husband just is the dumb muscle, except he's not really muscle, just fat now. Probably me against my dad. He was a real control freak and was obsessed with us kids being disciplined, undistracted, and obedient so we could have good lives. He felt strongly enough about all this that he'd fly into a rage every few days when I inevitably let the ball drop on any which certain issue. So I took my petty revenge by purposely faking up and in ways that would really grind his gears. This would make him even more strained which would make my petty revenge even more driven. Over time it began to be very ugly. This might seem like an odd way of dealing with things, but when you're a shy kid who doesn't have a voice or power in your life then you'll tend to find other ways of making yourself heard. The revenge began to get out of hand though. It started to appear in more ways, more often. My dad cared about me, and I loved him, but I also found myself hating, vehemently hating him. In the moments immediately after his more unreasonable or violent outbursts, in quiet cold rage and hurt of my own I'd make my move. I remember slightly opening a tap to drip overnight onto a large pile of papers placed underneath he'd printed for his business. I killed his best plants he'd grown in our garden and a hundred hundred more things. I began to take my cold silent rage out on two other poor kids at school and also in many other ways. And of course on myself. And skipping forwards a good few horrible years is the biggest act of revenge of the lot. What I chose to do with my life once I became free of my dad's control. I chose to go against everything that he had taught me and wanted for me. I abandoned my childhood dreams and passions and gave up my education, my opportunities, and my very health. I derailed my own train hard and left it derailed, a statement to the man who so wanted to see that train flourish and prosper. Why? Because that's how I found I could speak. That's how I could have some kind of control over my life. Because that's how I felt. Writing this out made me quite emotional. I don't hate my dad now. I recognize that his flaws and mistakes are remnants of a childhood that was much more of a struggle than mine. But, now I'm just a stranded, lost soul. Just don't be a fact to your kids. I posted this once, before on a different sub, but, so I used to live in an apartment building that has a shared laundry in the basement. There are 10 washers and 10 dryers. I had a single load of laundry to do before a flight the next morning. So I headed downstairs with my basket. Two machines are running when I get down there. There's also a single couple taking up eight washers to sort their laundry. I asked politely if they could divide one of them up into one seventh s and put it in with their others so I can use a machine. They decline. Apparently they have a system and tell me to wait however long it takes for the next person to claim their stuff. To get the next machine. At this point I realize it's time to get petty. I wait until they leave and then go hit the pause button on all of their machines. I need to stall. Then I wait for the next washer to free up. I transfer this innocent bystander's ratty old towels immediately 
pay for their dryer and leave a note to which dryer it's in. Then I start my washer, and I hit, run on my machine. I wait a few more minutes, and then resume all of their washers. They come back down in the 40 minutes it takes to run, and are mildly confused by why their machines are taking longer than usual. They suspect no foul play. By this point my washer is finishing up, so I grab a laundry cart and empty it out. I then proceed to take my laundry and divide it into 8 different dryers, like 2 shirts and a couple socks per dryer lol, and set them all running, one by one, as they watch in bitter disbelief. And then I settle down in a chair to watch my $12.50 of petty revenge spin. TLDR person took up all the washers in the laundry room, so I made them watch as I took all the dryers. When I was in high school in the late 1990s, I worked at a pretty nice golf course on the edge of town. All of the staffers, myself included, were a very rowdy group of kids, all age 14, 20, overseen by my 28 year old who we all loved as a boss. It was caddy shack times Van Wilder, and the shenanigans were real. We would set fire to boxes out in the cart shed to trigger the sprinklers, or hose down the garage floor, so we could see who could do the most 360s parking golf carts, you had to slide them in sideways to win. There was a wall out of sight from the customers that we just threw things through to be destructive, rubber, tire irons, knives. We would overshock the pool to see if we could bleach our hair or drive golf carts across greens to scare the geese away. So anyway, for some reason one year we got into water gun fights. My friend Carter squirted me or hit me with a water balloon or something while I was wearing my nice golf clothes that we had to work in. I wasn't mad, but I guess I was just a little too excitable at that age, maybe 16. I ran out on the back porch and got the high volume water hose we used to fill the horse troughs with beer and water for the nightly meal events. I turned it on full blast, pinched the end over, then walked into the clubhouse and literally fire hosed Carter and more or less the entire snack bar all at once. I then chased him down the hallway toward the golf shop hosing him, the walls, the couches, the ugly paintings, the carpet, the ceiling, everything. My boss, who was like 6 feet 8 inches tall and built like a drive-in movie screen, came running out of his office just in time to get a few splashes himself as Carter streaked by. I got fired on the spot. I walked out, turned the water off, walked back into my boss's office and said, Come on bull, you don't want to fire me. I'll be in tomorrow. The next day I walked in, clocked in and got to work. Worked there another 3 or 4 years. TLDR. Carter brought a water gun to a fire hose fight. I used to live with two other guys that I went to high school with. It was the middle of winter and one of my roommates, let's call him Megabyte for short, he was a huge mama's boy and his mom pretty much fought all battles for him even in college, went back home over Christmas. While he was gone I used our underground parking spot, which was included in our end. A week or so later Megabyte comes back and says hey can you move your car from the underground spot I told him I suppose so, not really thinking much of it, but I didn't really hurry to do it. Roughly 5 minutes later Megabyte comes back into my room and demands I move it, or he's going to call a tow truck, even though I pay for it as well, and had my own parking pass. So whatever, I eventually did it just to make him happy, but our relationship there was pretty strained afterwards. Also, at the time he was begin to low L. So every time I knew he was at home and playing low L I would go over to my PC and delete one of my largest game files and then start to re-download it, thus giving him a decent amount of lag. It was great to listen to his outbursts of frustration from the lag he was getting. I had a Filipino superior in the military that didn't like white people. I'm very white. He was even vocal about it and once told me I'm gonna take you down. It was the last year of my 8 years of service. I was one of the most highly decorated people in my command and in 7 years had never even had an evaluation where I didn't get an EP. Stands for early promote, the highest mark you can get. He takes over our shop and I start getting constantly written up, like everyday counseling chits. You get three of those in a short time and they send to a disciplinary review board. Where the E7 to E9s of your command spend a few hours calling you a piece of sheet and then come up with a plan to rectify your problems. 
I went to 4 DRBs before I found myself in NJP standing in front of my commanding officer. This is where they dock your pay, send you to the brig etc. Before I went to captain's mast I recorded this guy saying some racist sheet among other things, like he wished I had been shot overseas and never returned, in our shop. Then I requested counsel with my co, private meeting, but was denied, because I had been made to look like a dirtbag. The day of my NJP my co read my charges, sighed and asked I understand you wish to speak to me in private, almost in tears I replied yes sir I would. He looked this guy dead in the eye, but spoke to the room get the fuck out. We sat down and talked about the situation. I offered the recording, but he already knew. He removed me from the shop and had me work in a different area, and I thought it was the end of it. Shortly thereafter we had a change of command, new co, and I was placed right back under this guy's thumb. I only had two months left in the service, and I made the best of it. I would do things like go to magazine racks at the base store, take all the subscription slips, fill out his info and check the bill me later box. He would get piles of magazines and freak out. I did other things like taking reports he had done and slipped them in the trash, and watching him look like an idiot when asked for said report. But the best one and my favorite. I showed up really early one day before the start of my last week in the military, ate some god awful things, and took a sheet in a Pringles can. He loved Pringles. I poked a few holes in it and hid it in the back of the bottom drawer of his desk. Every day he'd come in and say in his variation accent why is it always smelled like puking sheet in here. I guess I kinda got the last laugh though as I was tradition at hour on your last day to sit down with the co to discuss your time, what you think they might to make the place more enjoyable for others etc. I spent my time with co discussing this guy. Handing over recording, after recording of his racist tirades, laughing about how poorly he treated some people, and got away with it etc. This nuka was understandably a little shocked, and the last I heard his orders were changed, he was punished, and was sent to a new command early. TLDR I took a sheet in a Pringles can, and ruined a guy's career, after he attempted to ruin mine. Okay, so... This was a few months back, but I'm still kind of proud of it, probably shouldn't be, but whatever. I work in retail, and I mainly work in the shoe department at my store. One day, I'm going through the aisles recovering, picking stuff up, and sizing. I get to the girl's shoe aisle and almost start crying, because of the mess. There are shoes literally thrown up and down the aisle, like random singles, no matches. It was all shoes from one end of the aisle. There was a woman at the end of it, where the shoes go, and as I was turning the corner I saw her throw one of the shoes down the aisle, toward me, so I knew directly who the culprit was. So. She spots me, and shamelessly asks me for help. I have to faking wade through the giant mess she made to even get to her. I mean there were easily 20 shoe singles just thrown on the ground everywhere. We just don't do stuff like that at my store. She wants a pair of shoes, but she can't seem to find the one in the size she needs. She's rude through the entire interaction, and I decided I was going to be a beach right back. I told her I would help her, but that I needed to pick up this awful mess that someone had made before I was able to do that, for better chances of finding the shoes of course. Lol. So I get to work on picking everything up, and taking my sweetest time doing it too. She was getting super impatient and even more beachy, if possible, and decided she would actually help me. She started putting things away where they actually went, and we made some good time too. Finally, we finished. I told her that unfortunately through all of that, I wasn't able to find the shoes that she needed, so she would have to go to another store if she wanted them. She was so faking mad, it was glorious. She definitely knew what I had done, but didn't say anything. We have cameras, so if she would have complained I would have just shown my manager what she had done, because surely the camera had caught it. She left, cussing the whole way. I felt a lot better after that. In college, I lived with the same girl for all three years, after moving out of the dorms. I knew the third year was going to be a mistake before signing the lease, but I really didn't want to move, just to move again in a year. Right before graduating we had been getting in a lot of arguments and the living situation was pretty hostile. My roommate was an on and off stripper all through college and always had stupid sheet laying around the house. A lot of cocaine. Graduation rolls up, 
and I'm cleaning the house like a mad woman, since I will have a lot of family and friends in out throughout the weekend. So, I ask her to keep the house clean. A reasonable request I felt. Well the night of my ceremony I came home pretty blitzed, luckily not with the family members who were to sleep on our couch. There was sheet everywhere. The vacuum was unraveled all over the place, lamps tipped over, and best of all, her cocaine mirror and coke lines sitting on the coffee table. In a bout of rage I threw, said cocaine mirror out the front door which shattered on our sidewalk. Dumb beach called the police on me at 3am. After explaining that it was drugs I threw out, they still arrested me for destruction of property. Great balls of fury, I was livid. Rest of graduation weekend I stay with friends and try to keep my sheet together so my family doesn't find out what happened. The week after, I get a group of people together and they come over to help me out during a 3 hour block I knew for sure she wouldn't be home and I moved out. Mind you, everything in the apartment was mine. Our kitchen table, couches, bowls, silverware, the wifi router, even the faking shower curtain. All mine. And I packed every bit of it up, called the landlord to return my keys, and I was out. It looked like the house had been robbed. Few hours later I get texts of her freaking out on me. I don't respond to anything, because at this point I'm already walking on thin ice legally with the arrest. She texts me every day for weeks telling me I owe her this and that and utility money, yada yada. I finally get the clear from the city that I'm clear and the way the police handled the situation was ridiculous and they are not going to press charges. Conveniently the same day, ex-rumored texts me threatening to take me to small claims court. Little backstory, girlfriend's parents are psycho controlling and know nothing about her. No idea she's been stripping all through school and sleeping around doing and selling drugs. If they ever found out they would quit paying for her school which is ironic in this case because she was about to go to a very expensive out of state law school. Well, when I get this text I collect every single blackmail picture I have of her stripping, doing drugs, crazy spring breaks, the works. I obtain her mother's phone number through her sister. Sister tells rumor this. I respond to rumored with a simple, if you don't do the smart thing and leave me alone, I will 100% ruin your faking life. Haven't heard from her since. It was nurses week and I'd been on mandatory overtime for the past 13 weeks. I was burned out and completely over everything when I was written up for having a bad attitude and complaining about the food a rep brought in for us, who brings fish? It faking stinks up the entire break room. I was so pissed I was either going to quit on the spot or plot something magnificent. And so I plotted. My hospital offers parking tokens, if you park off site and ride a shuttle, thereby opening more spots for visitors and patients in the parking garages. These tokens are worth $2 each, and I'd been saving them for a while. I had near $300 worth of these things that could only be used at the gift shop, cafeteria, or employee store. I grabbed my satchel of tokens and headed to, to the gift shop to begin my master plan of revenge. A half hour later I was paged to the front desk. There was a big balloon bouquet there with a gift tag thanking me for always having the best attitude. I feigned surprise and snapped a selfie with my mystery gifts. Who are they from? I was asked. It doesn't say. I replied. La la la. An hour later, more balloons and another winning attitude thank you tag show up. And again an hour later, more. Every hour for the duration of my shift. Imagine my surprise. All with beautiful little thank you tags proclaiming my amazing attitude during nurses week. TLDR. Got burned out from mandatory overtime as a nurse. Got in trouble for my attitude. Sent myself balloons from the gift shop every hour for my entire shift. Thanking me for my winning attitude. Paid for gifts with hospital parking tokens. I used to deliver Chinese food for this sketchy place back home, they didn't give a fuck what you did. Either way this lady placed an order, and it was one of my first free deliveries of the day. When she ordered she specified that she wanted exactly one egg roll, not a whole order, unusual and she was being a beach about it, getting angry with the waitress on the phone and whatnot. So either way her food is ready, and I drive straight to her place, which happens to be a duplex. I knock on the door and nobody answers, knock a few more time and her neighbor comes out. She opens with what the fuck do you want? 
and I explain I have food for her neighbor, so she just straight up opens her door and walks up the stairs. I hear a little bit of arguing, and she comes back down and says she won't pay because you took too long. I drove their first thing from the restaurant on a slow as day I probably got there within 20 minutes of order it wasn't late. After more arguing she simply refused to talk to me. So I got in my car and started to drive away, but before I left I got out, grabbed that beach's egg roll, and threw it as hard as I could. Made a big juicy splat of cabbage and oil on her door. Super nasty. She likes peeked out the door as I sped off, and I flipped her off. Definitely a bad move on my part, but I never got caught so fuck it. This is something that started out as a petty revenge, but then ended up consuming a lot of my free time during my freshman year of high school. So I had a neighbor let's just call him Chris. Chris wasn't the worst kid I knew, but if this were misspace he wouldn't be on my top 8. Now for the most part Chris and I got along well, and we would always talk on the way home from school about video games and music and stuff that freshmen talk about. Well one day on the way home from school Chris asked me if I wanted to go to church with him and his family that weekend, to which I replied something along the lines of no thanks man I don't really believe in god this must have struck a chord with Chris, because after that day Chris never spoke to me or acknowledged me. That was until Chris overheard a conversation I was having at school about smoking weed. Chris like the righteous young prick he was took it upon himself to tell his very religious parents my plans, who then took it upon themselves to tell my parents. This left me grounded for two weeks. During my time in the whole lack of my bedroom I devised a plan to put the fear of God in Chris. My bedroom window faced Chris's bedroom, and I thought about just throwing rocks at it throughout the night, but decided that wasn't enough, because snitches get stitches. So I ended up taking fishing line and tying it to my wireless Bluetooth speaker. I made sure there was enough line to reach from my window to the bushes under Chris's window. I then downloaded a bunch of satanic chants and satanic ritual sheet like the chant to summon Kvalhu onto my iPad. Every night when Chris went to bed at 9pm I would slowly open my window and lob my bluetooth speaker over to the bushes under Chris's window and start playing satanic chants. This went on every night for the two weeks I was grounded, but it didn't stop there. I saw the toll it was taking on Chris he would look dead tired at school, and I knew he was tired because I sat there most nights watching him turn his lights back on and look out the window, and sometimes he even got his parents to go take a peek but to no avail. I tasted blood, and I was going to push Chris as far as I could. For three months I continued this, and each day I would watch Chris turn his lights on slash off four to five times a night. I would set alarms on my phone throughout the night, so I could wake up and screw with him, and one final alarm, so I could reel in my satanic grenade before the sun came up. It got so bad there was nights I refused to go out with friends, so I could stay home and fuck with Chris. I eventually got bored of faking with Chris, so on the last night I put the Rick Roll song on the speaker long enough for him to hear it, but short enough not to wake anyone up besides Chris. Apparently this prank took a toll on Chris, because his grades dropped significantly that semester, and the next year his parents put him into a private Catholic school. I never really spoke to him after that despite being neighbors. Anyway Chris if you're out there this one is for you buddy HTTPS. Slash slash www.youtube.com slash Right out of high school I moved into an apartment with a couple friends. And myself and one of the roommates fell into the standard friends before, roommates during, not friends after cycle. One of those friends moved out, and the gap was filled with my second roommate's girlfriend. Now, the second roommate and her were supposed to be living a good old Catholic life, no living together before marriage, definitely no such before marriage, things like that. Note, I don't know much about Catholicism, this is just how I had it explained to me by them, so my perspective might be completely off. One day I come home, go to my room and immediately trip over a pile of my stuff directly in the path leading into my room. I ask them what that's about, and get a response from her well we have a theme for the living room now, and your stuff, well it just didn't match anything fine. I did the things I wanted to do in the kitchen, and went back, and hung out in my room. Later that night I was listening to music and pull my headphones off and hear thud, 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 thud silence. 
I realized that my roommates were banging away, and their bed was on the same wall as my bed. It ended up being a really long night trying to sleep. Also she was supposed to be a virgin till marriage per her own admission. The next day I went and moved their bed a couple inches from the wall, so I didn't have to hear it anymore. That night he mentioned casually to her, while I was standing there well it looks like we managed to move the bed a little last night and guffawed. He didn't guffaw, but it was gross and fuck him. The trash can is a bloody, literally, implement for preventing pregnancy to keep it at least semi-FFW. Great. So I had to see and throw that out. A couple weeks passed and I had let them know that I was no longer going to be living with them as soon as my new apartment was ready well they had an opening and I was able to get in within another couple weeks I agreed to pay out my rent until the end of my lease to them, it wasn't long, and started packing and getting ready to move. The day before I was scheduled to move my roommate told me that her parents were going to be in town. He said that, because he and her weren't supposed to be living together, she was going to sleep in the living room, and since I was moving out, her parents were going to sleep in my room. That night he then told me that they were going to be gone most of the next day to give me time to pack and spend time with her parents. A plan formed in my mind. I quickly boxed and moved everything up the next day and then spent several hours completely redoing the bathroom's decor. I waited at the old apartment until they all came in the door talking and laughing, then silence. I walked out of my room carrying a bag of stuff and smiled at her parents and introduced myself. I then looked down at the kitchen counter and motioned to the stuff on the counter, which included condoms, feminine hygiene products, shower supplies and a toothbrush don't worry about all this stuff I said. See, there's a theme for the bathroom and even though, girl's name, moved in, girl's name, stuff just really didn't fit with the theme, and walked away I've never seen or spoken to them since. Someone stole my food and my lunch box out of the refrigerator at work, a nice decent sized green cooler, I could spot it anywhere, my wife bought it for me, and it had a slight tear on side where the strap connected. My wife drew a little face, so that it looked like its mouth. A month or so goes by after that fateful day, and as I'm walking through the parking lot what do I see? A male cowwalker getting out of their car with my lunch box. My whole body went numb with a cold fury. I pursued, he put his lunch in the fridge, and went to his desk. I logged into my supervisor's scheduling system, to see what time his lunch was, and went on my lunch about 10 minutes before he did. He came into the cafe to see me with lunch barks on the table, sitting right in front of the doors eating his homemade chicken and yellow rice never breaking eye contact. He came over sat across and said jokingly at first hey um I think you're eating my lunch haha, no this is mine it was in my lunch box. But that's my, no it isn't bro I can't believe you would eat someone else's food the nerve of this motherfucker I lost my cool at this and slammed my hands down and monologued in a half yell all my months of frustration and dislike towards this individual. The whole room went silent and our our manager happened to be at the table behind me took us both to her office and asked us to prove who the owner was. I called my wife right there on speaker and had her describe it which she nailed to every last detail. I don't even remember what his lamaya's excuse was but they have a zero tolerance policy for theft so they walked him out right then and there. TLDR Kawaka stole my lunch box and brought it back a month later. Ate his lunch and got him fired. Throw away. A few years ago my then girlfriend worked for Dollar General. She was a great worker and often took on additional shifts whenever they asked and in return they treated her like garbage. Well I don't appreciate companies that treat their hard working employees like that and began plotting my revenge on DG. There are a number of stores in our area and pretty much all are in some sort of disarray, but there was one store that always stayed clean and organized, the workers were happy, and the manager was extremely happy. I made it a point to go to this Dollar General as often as possible, sometimes driving across town just to shop there. After I became a regular, I started chatting with the store manager and offered her a position at my mattress store. Turns out she was one of the top ranked managers with the company and had won numerous awards for reducing shrink and beating sales goals on a regular basis. 
It took about a year to convince her to come join my company in an entirely different industry, but I promised her she would be making as much as she currently was and would only work 40 hours a week instead of the 70, 80 she currently worked. What really convinced her was all the time she would have with her granddaughter. She eventually went back to DG after about a year with me, but they had to give her a hefty raise to win her back. In the meantime the store she had been running fell to the bottom of the company and they will probably shut it down soon. Oh well. TLDR got pissed at a company because of how they treated girlfriend, actively poached one of their top managers resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost sales and increased thefts at the store she left. I'm very late and this will probably be buried and no one will know this hilarious story. My husband's family is redneck. His uncle was out one night with two of his friends. They were driving around in a pickup truck spotting deer. All three were wearing work type bib overalls. They were passing a jar of moonshine between them. So there's the driver, then uncle in the middle, then other friend. Driver and friend had been arguing over something stupid, I don't know what it was about. Anyway, friend passes out from the moonshine. Driver notices and tears off to the man's house. Driver gets out, asks uncle to help him move friend onto his own front lawn. Driver then proceeds to take off friend's overalls, drops his own pants, and takes a crap into the passed out guy's overalls. Driver pulls the overalls back up, tells flabbergasted uncle to get in the truck, and they leave friend laying on his own front lawn with someone else's sheet in his overalls. The next day uncle drives by friend's house. Uncle sees the guy outside raking leaves, so he pulls over and asks friend how he is feeling. Oh, man, I had a bad night. Really? What happened? Friend says well I'll tell you one thing, that moonshine really cleans a man out. Uncle asks how so? Friend says well I'll be honest with you, I sheet my pants last night. Uncle says well that happens sometimes. Friend says no man, it wasn't just that. There was corn in my sheet, and I haven't eaten corn in 5 years. True story. My ex, who told me she didn't love me, wasn't ever going to be attracted to me again, or see a future with me decided that, even though I paid rent for the month, and was still looking for an apartment, she didn't want me living in our apartment, that only her name was on, and she didn't live in anymore, because I had started dating someone else. I was incredibly hurt and mad by this, so I naturally took all the cleaning supplies when I moved out and she was coming back to move her stuff out with her family. About two months later I realized that I had been incredibly petty and had sunken to her level. She had constantly harassed me after we broke up about me hanging out with the same people as I did when we dated and constantly tried to imply I was at fault for everything wrong under the stars while refusing to admit she was being a child. At one point it got so bad she actually tried to make me feel bad for getting back in shape and getting a great job right after we broke up by telling me I had no idea how my new success made her feel. Later later that night, I was a few drinks in, when it dawned on me that, while I had been petty, I hadn't been petty enough, so I filed an anonymous immigration tip on her family's restaurant for knowingly employing illegals with fake SS in it. My parents started their own business when I was a teenager. Everything we had went into it, savings accounts were emptied, we slept there sometimes, in order to work late on decorating or repairs, even my younger brothers, one of them nine, were pulling their weight. After a few years of steady business, rent on the building, started increasing to the point that our profit margin all but disappeared. We sold up, and another business moved in, taking advantage of all the equipment and facilities we'd installed little by little. Being stupid kids, the last day before we left my brother and I went around and took any small things that wouldn't be missed extension cords, stools, door stops then we stuck it all on eBay, this being the early days when the idea of eBay was still novel. We had a good laugh at the ill, gotten pocket change we made and considered that the end of it. Except it turns out a friend of mine decided to take our bad fortune personally. A few more years pass, and I hear that he's been cursing loudly at the building every time he walks past since we sold it. People kept telling him how weird this was, but he didn't care. When his girlfriend at the time happened to get a job there he decided it was time to up his game. 
Every opportunity he got he pocketed something small. Cans of coke. Cookies a lot of the time he didn't even want them. Just gave them to people on the street. As we grew older still, his girlfriend, who somehow still had a job there, was trusted to lock up at night, which meant if he went to pick her up he could take his shenanigans to whole new levels. Over the next six months he delighted in taking back every little decoration or personal touch that was still left on the premises from when my family started renovating the building and gave all of them back to me whenever could, always with a big sheet-eating grin on his face. This finally culminated one night at a party when he drunkenly told me how he'd taken his girlfriend's and all virginity in the stockroom. His reasoning? Well bud, felt only right returning the favor after they faked your whole family in the ass. He broke up with his girlfriend a few months after that. I have no idea how far it would have gone if he still had access to that building, but I half expected him to show up outside my house one day drunkenly laughing with half the building stashed under his coat. Had a girlfriend once that was sleeping over my place most of the week in order to shorten her commute. She also ended up owing me a fair amount of money for various things that I documented on a whiteboard in my office. She ended up cheating on me with a co-worker, lying about it, then finally caving after I had evidence. So we broke up. Fast forward a few months and she gets fired, has to scramble to find another job in the area and the other guy doesn't want a relationship with her. So she comes crawling back, which led to petty revenge hash one. After a lengthy and torrid hate slash grudge fack of epic proportions, said ex-girlfriend says she wants nothing more than a hot bath and to go to bed. At which point I hand her her purse and say I never said you can stay overnight. The look on her face as she limped back to her car for the hour rush hour drive to her family's house was absolutely priceless. She comes by the next day to talk about things. I point to the cash value on my whiteboard and tell her she can start staying over again as soon as that money is paid back. And I'm not treating her for anything until that happens. So I enjoyed a few months of makeup sech, having my own place and a girlfriend that paid for her own tab when we went out to eat, which led to petty revenge hash too. She eventually paid back all the money she owed me and wanted to move in. So we went out to dinner and I deliberately didn't order anything other than a beer. She asked me what the issue was and I said, do you remember when you lied about faking dollar sign c-o-w-o-r-k-e-r? Her face immediately turns beet red no answer. So I ask again. Her face gets redder and she won't even make eye contact. I say, well I do. And you are definitely going to remember how it felt when I lied about taking you back, which is never ever going to happen. Goodbye. I drop a 20 on the table to cover the beer slash tip slash trouble and walk back out to my car, blocking her cell phone number on the way. Last I heard from her. Petty as fuck, but oh so satisfying. I didn't actually have to do anything but I'll tell you what I considered my revenge. I had dated a girl in college who I really liked but she broke up with me at the end of my junior year. So we don't talk all summer but when the fall starts again we are living on the same hallway and generally just bumping into each other. We were always polite but I was hurting from heartbreak. It wasn't too long before she had another guy named Bryce she was always hanging out with. I coped by putting my head down and spending my spare time playing hockey. Now this was a small state school in a southern state, so while hockey had a following, it wasn't huge. It kind of became my identity. I wasn't particularly good, but it was what I enjoyed. So fast forward to a school, sponsored trip to the ice rink. This girl and Bryce are there, and Bryce is skating circles around everyone, me included. Turns out he'd played his whole life. So I'm doing my best not to let him bother me while he shows off. Halfway through the public skate, they kick us off to Zamboni and Bryce is the first one back on. And he tries to pivot and just busts it. His temple hit the ice with a crack. They had to call the ambulance. He got a dozen stitches and had a concussion. All as a result of falling into shade. Everybody saw it because they had wait while the ice was resurfaced to get the blood off. He had to sit embarrassed while he turned down the EMT's care. She ended up staying while he went to urgent care. I don't know where they are now or if they ever ended up together, but I damn if I didn't milk every ounce of satisfaction out of that I could. 
I used to make music more or less as a part-time job. I moved into a new apartment that had downstairs neighbors. I did absolutely everything I could to be a good neighbor, but every time I would sit down to make music, after about 10 minutes, no matter what time of the day, I would get a banging on the floor or ceiling. This was annoying, but I tried to respect their living space, not wanting noise, etc. Until football season started. Every day a football game was on, they would scream and shout at the TV. This was my breaking point. I had enough. I went downstairs and tried to talk with the neighbors to ask them why it was fair for them to more or less shut down my work days, but think it's okay to scream at the TV when a football game is on. Well, needless to say, the neighbors were cocky redneck idiots and tried to fight me, what the fuck, so I had enough. I looked up the sound regulations in the neighborhood and made sure I was in the clear. Being a musician, naturally, I had some great speakers that could push some serious volume. For the next 3 months, every single day I would leave for work, I would put on the 10 hour YouTube videos of Tralalalalol, Nan Cat, and Bacon Pancakes at full volume. They did everything they could to complain, but since I was keeping within the sound regulations, I was in the clear. They tried to fight with me after this, they ended up getting arrested and moved out shortly afterwards. All you had to do was let me get my work done dude. Back in high school I worked at a local grocery store. I cashiered slash stocked slash collected carts the whole nine yards. Well I was heavily involved in the punk and metal scene and dressed as such. Combat boots, plaid pants, band shirts, dyed mohawk, huge gauged ears, etc. One day I'm out collecting carts and this douchey preteen kid is going into the store with his mom. As he passes by me he points and laughs and calls me some cliche derogatory name under his breath. I flip him the bird which turned his sheepish smile into a look of fear. I finish getting the carts put up and start stocking one of the aisles and hear my name called on the intercom to come bag a customer's groceries. I go to the front of the store and guess who it is. That's right it was the douchey preteen and his mom. I proceed to bag the groceries and muster up the most evil look I can and proceed to give the death glare to this kid who's doing his best not to look at me because he can obviously see it in his peripherals. I walk the cart out to this lady's car and start loading groceries in the very back. I run out of room, so she tells me to put the rest in the back seat next to her son. I open the door and he has a look of absolute terror on his face. So as I'm putting groceries next to him, I roll my eyes back so the whites are exposed and start gnashing and grinding my teeth like I'm a ravenous cannibal and he starts to cry and sob. His mother never saw any of this and was very kind to me. She even gave me a few bucks for helping her with the groceries. I hope he learned his lesson. I worked for Walmart for a number of years, one of which I worked an overpass shift. Night shift workers are usually pretty unique, especially in factory slash stocking settings. We had an assistant manager that was a douchebag. Super creepy toward the female employees, blamed other people for his fuck ups, threatened people's jobs, super micromanager, etc. A few months after I started he announced his retirement. One of the things we had to do in the shift was round up all the carts, because our turnover rate was so bad that none of our cart pushers stayed more than a few weeks. On the night of his retirement, we had another manager radio him and say there was an issue with his car in the parking lot. As manager douchebag came running out and we all congratulated him on his retirement. Then we used a huge roll of sarin wrap from receiving and wrapped him to his car. He didn't have a coat on. It was January. About 45 minutes he'd managed to cut through the wrap with his car keys. No one bothered to check on him or help him during that time, although a couple customers mentioned it to the front end employees. TLDR Saren wrapped in his hole to his car to celebrate his retirement. TLDWR, friend sheets in a box, wraps it up as a present and puts it under a Christmas tree over a bad grade. So back in college, a few years ago my friend gets us to think that this other group hated us. Now, he had been insinuating this over the course of months while we got drunk, so after a while, and with no evidence to the contrary, we had started to believe him. This group then buys a Christmas tree, decorates it, and puts it in the lounge across from one of their rooms. So he tries to convince us to 
collectively, sheet in a show box, wrap it up as Christmas present, and put it under the tree. Only one person did it, the rest of us taking a step back. Granted, we didn't stop it, but still. Dead of night, 3am on a snow day, they put it under the tree. Apparently they open it, thinking that someone was giving them props for their tree. Now, it stank up the whole hallway up to the elevators for the rest of the semester. Then we get back for the next semester, guy comes clean that he instigated this because one of the kids got him a bad grade in a group project a year ago. Faking Meredith. I was in high school during the peak popularity period of Halo 3 multiplayer. Everyone from school played, and one day we got a pretty full custom game lobby going on, 16 or so people, and the final one to join was this particular asshole of a kid from our football team who I'd had problems with for years. His name was actually Meredith. He joins a lobby, notices I'm present, and that he has an audience of about 15 people from school then just starts to show off by abruptly berating me with the most personal insults possible, making fun of myself and my family using the worst slurs the internet had taught him, then demanded I leave the lobby. To my disadvantage, the verbal attack was so unexpected and loud most people in the lobby began laughing. I muted him and stayed to play but all I could hear was the continuing laughter of those listening to his constant insults. After that game I quit out, got his phone number from a mutual friend, and made a new online profile with it as the Gamertag account name. I played on that for two days before deleting it. He apparently had to get a new phone number from all the calls he was getting from random people and his parents made him pay for a new phone himself, and he couldn't afford a nice one, like he had before. He also went as far as to file a police report and warned everyone that he was going to find out who did it, but I was too busy laughing to care. The cherry on top was me knocking the wind out of him during football practice the following Monday. 10 tenths revenge moment, still remember it 6 years later. I lived in a large city where I went to grad school and bartended. The service industry was really well connected and everyone helped each other out. One summer, our hockey team won the Stanley Cup, and as per tradition, the Stanley Cup spent the next week touring the city with the players whatever club the cup ended up in was the most popular and exclusive club of the night. My best friend, Sarah and I were hanging out and decided we wanted to go clubbing. She called one of her girlfriends, Amy, who told us she was at a pregame and was heading to Studio, one of the most exclusive club in the city. Sarah asked how she was getting in, and Amy told us her boyfriend was a socialite. Sarah asked if we could come to the pregame, but when Amy found out I was with them, she freaked out. Basically saying I was embarrassing and wouldn't get them in. Unfazed, Sarah and I headed to studio and happened to arrive at the same time Amy did. We quickly found out the Stanley Cup and the entire hockey time was partying at studio, and there was a throng to get in. I leaned over and asked Amy if she needed my help getting in. I guess she misheard me and goes honestly, you're not my responsibility and I'm not going to ask my boyfriend to get you in. I look towards the front of the line and see her boyfriend fighting with one of the bouncers. The same bouncer that works at my bar. I grabbed Sarah's hand, went up to him and gave him a bear hug. He quickly opened the rope for me and Sarah and I saw Amy trying to get in with me. The bouncer looks at me and goes is she with you? To which I turned around, looked Amy in the eyes, and went now. Nah. Amy didn't get into studio that night, but Sarah and I got a lot of texts apologizing and asking if we'd talk to the bouncer from her. I had just had my wisdom teeth out and was waiting for my prescription to be filled at the pharmacy. The anesthetic was wearing off and the pain was already intense. I had a mouth full of bloody gauze that I had to change often. I waited for 15 minutes until finally they called my name. As I'm about to get in line, a small Asian woman runs to get in front of me in the line that clearly says prescriptions only. She then attempts to get a refund on a bottle of salad dressing. The pharmacist tells her that she is in the wrong place and directs her to the customer service desk at the front of the store. She is having none of it. She pounds her fist on the counter. He is going to give her a refund and she's not going anywhere until she gets it. 
After a few more futile attempts to explain that she will get a refund just not here at the prescription only counter the pharmacist writes something down on a post-it, gives it to the woman, and tells her to take it to the customer service desk. This is something she seems to understand. And then she turns around, and there I am, bloody haggard mess, in excruciating pain, staring her right in the eye. I reach into my mouth and pull out two saliva-covered, bloody wads of gauze, and offer them to her with a meek smile. She screamed like a little girl and ran away. The look on the pharmacist's face was priceless. I'm a consulting engineer, and in my line of work, we bill by the hour. It's similar to how lawyers bill their time. So, I've been working on a number of large projects, and I do my best to track my hours, and make sure that they are accurate. However, I have one boss that I despise. He constantly micromanages the staff, gives them poor to no guidance, and then throws them under the bus, because they inevitably screw something up due to his poor management abilities. He never reads anything we send him, and whenever he gets a phone call or email from a client, he goes into a kind of panic attack and starts making people drop everything they are doing to attend to his little emergencies. I've had to drop everything once to help him rotate a page on Adobe PDF. For this big project I'm working on with him, he has me come in early every day before he arrives, and he wants me to leave the office after he does. He also wants me to work weekends as well, about half of which I reluctantly come over. Most of this time is spent redoing work that we have already done, but that he screwed up because he didn't read the guidelines the client gave us. It's been going on like this since June, and we are still not done with this project, yet. How do I get my revenge? Simple. Any time he asks me to do anything, I charge one half hour of time. That little PDF rotation thing. Yeah, it took me two minutes to go to his office and rotate a PDF for him, but I charged 30. And on all of these really long days, where I'm working 10 plus hours a day, yeah, I charge 10.5 hours. I keep on taking little bits of time away from this project. He's the only person I do this for. Luckily for me, he does not really check the time we charge for any of his jobs. What purpose does this accomplish? My company does not pay us overtime. However, they do give us staff engineers comp time. Think about it as extra time off for more than 40 hours billed per week if we have to work long weeks. My boss is an associate and he does not get comp time. He has to slave away on all of his miserable weekends without any extra pay, and he has to do it on his own time. Meanwhile, I've saved up 5 weeks worth of comp time, and make certain that I will be taking all of that time off within the next year. And yes, this is on top of the 4 weeks of time off that I've saved up as well. I can take 9 weeks off next year if I wanted to, and there's nothing my company can do about it. TLDR. Boss wastes my time, so I waste his, and I win. The hostel we have at my college is very badly maintained and old. Staying without food or the comfort of home is never great OFC. So I try to make a nice meal occasionally, or keep a clean room just to keep spirits up. My roommate, for some reason, decided from day one that I was her enemy, and to top that she was messy to the point of being unhygienic. She'd throw nail clippings and trash around the room, leave dirty dishes lying around for days till they attracted ants and flies, then there was the bucket of weeks old stagnant water that she used to wash her hands or face with when she felt lazy to go to the faking washrooms. I requested politely a few times that she keep the room clean since we were both sharing the room. But nope, she'd just be unreasonable about it and do even more she'd just to spite me. Now, our room was old f and painted this depressing grey blue when we shifted in. The walls had chipped paint all over, covered in graffiti by the past occupants. The plaster on the ceiling had given away in many places. In my second years, I decided to have the room painted and the ceiling patched up a little. Best money I spent made life so much more pleasant. I might've done this when my roommate was back home. And with everything going on, the dreaded bucket might have been misplaced, read, hidden behind all the junk she'd stored in the overhead shelves we'd been given. Also it might have happened that I got only my half of the room fixed up, since she liked living in a mess. It looked like someone mashed two different rooms together. The stark contrast made her half look even worse. 
oh the look on her face when she came back was priceless edit. TLDR had only my half of the room fixed up and painted to spite to room it for being messy and a beach. In my apartment building we have a wide variety of people living. We have retired folk, grandparents living out their golden years, transplants from out of state, people of different races, cultures, and backgrounds. And we also have a resident neckbird. Late twenties, neat, mooches off his brother. And has a 2012 sports car, paid by his parents, that he doesn't take care of. The tail light lenses are cracking, the paint is fading and getting weird streaks from years of rain rune off w slash o being washed, rotors are perma rusty, etc. For comparison, and what it's worth, I drive a beat up 90s model Honda. For some reason, he absolutely has to have the first parking spot. He doesn't care who else isn't home yet old people, people with a ton of groceries, etc. That first spot is his, even though we do not have assigned parking. He will park in it, and leave his vehicle sitting for weeks, sometimes months, at a time, just to keep others from having it. If by some chance, someone else manages to take it, he will wait and move his car to it immediately, after it becomes open. I know this, because I watched him do this one morning as I left for a grocery store run, having parking in the aforementioned space the evening prior. While I was sitting at the red light in front of the apartment building, I saw him run out to his car and reclaim his spot. Now, I'm normally a fairly chill guy. Real live and let live type. It's not that I particularly care about what spot I park in, but rather the fact that someone will go out of their way to claim it, even if they are literally parked right next to it. That evening, as I was willing away my hours on the internet, I kept my blinds cracked open to observe if the RN, resident neckbird, would move his car again, whether it be to procure tendies, visit the Warhammer 40k store across the street, or anything else neat folk venture out of their house for. Once he was gone, I moved my car to the recently open space, leaving the only next available spot to be my former one at the other end of the lot. But, my friends, the story does not end there. When the work week started, and I left to be a productive member of society, I once again witnessed the spectacle of the neck but moving his vehicle. Alright, it's on now. I end up biding my time, waiting for the spot to open again. As soon as it does, I make it a point to get to my car, so this person can watch me take his spot, hoping that the message I'm trying to send of I'm calling you out on your bullshit, now stop it comes across clearly. It does not. Weeks of this back and forth turn into months, during the time I'm trying to make a further point of this person's shenanigans by not moving my vehicle when it becomes available after a third party claims it. His brother parks there, and then leaves again. Cool. W slashy. Other neighbors park there and move. No big deal. Neckbird moves there and leaves. I'm on it, and vice versa. It has now been 3 years since this started. I've tried leaving friendly notes, since I do not know which app it is and his bros, politely asking if he's not going to be driving his vehicle on the regular to move it to a lesser used parking spot, so that those of us who work regular jobs, guests, and our elderly neighbors, can make use of it. Nothing. To this day, if his car is in it and later leaves, I will take it with all due haste. If it is open, when I get home, and his car is nowhere to be found, I will take it, until I see him parked in another space, and then move for others. If it is taken by a third party, or if it's open and he's home, I'll leave it be. It's just, damn, I mean, it's been over 3 years of this stuff. I very well can't relent now, it's gone on too far. The only option is for him to admit defeat. Edit, TLDR, been fighting with the neck but over the same parking spot for the past 3 years, after watching him take the spot, after I had left for a grocery store run, and leave his car, to sit in it for weeks on end. I was had an assistant store manager who was a proper dick. Just someone who hated me, and I couldn't figure out why or what I'd done to make him dislike me so much. Constantly asking me what I was doing, or why I hadn't done this or done that. Never using the official company policy of praise critique praise just always on the critique. So one day I start my night shift, and get told all I have to do, is sort the back stock out as we've ordered on the Friday. I smash out 12 of the 13 cages, and think to myself, I've done a good job last night. 
assistant manager comes over to speak to me bang on 0700, my finishing time, to ask me what I've done. Told him yeah done this and that. He asks me, when I pulled out the cages, did I sweep under them? I was blown away that he would ask me such a random thing. Naturally I tell him sorry I didn't. He then pulls me up for about 20 minutes for not doing various jobs, that on jobs or jobs for the cleaners, so the following day I do my work go and find him at 0650 tell him I did the delivery, faced up and that was all. He then asked me why that's all I did, I knew he would, because I set him up to ask me, and turn around, and tell him I'll wait what I also did, was date checked all the DVDs. He looks at me super puzzled, so I elaborate, that I didn't find any DVD about to be going out of date. He walks away, and didn't speak to me for 3 months and that was to say bye as he left the company. There is CCTV footage of me at that store picking up each DVD, and looking at the back case. I don't know if it's petty as much as it's outright theft, but I was the assistant to a chef in a major city. She was tech illiterate and a tyrant to boot. I was the never thank de facto computer person, copy a fixer, tech trainer, etc. And I knew she didn't know her way around a printer, let alone the brand new Max purchased for the office. My birthday is in November and fell on a Saturday. The restaurant staff used to go ape for people's birthdays but mine came and went without a peep, including through a weekly meeting where much time was devoted to calling out birthdays, anniversaries, etc. So the next day as I was on my way to have birthday dinner with friends, I got a text from them asking me to call so I could help them fix the copier. I didn't respond. On Monday I came in to find a cookie and a hasty note wishing me a happy birthday. Four of the office staff went to lunch that day and brought me back two rolls of sushi and half a pile of salad left over. In addition to other trifling bullshit, stress, and insults that lasted over a year, I gave my notice that week. I left weeks later and took a laptop with me as well as a hard drive that contained 10 years of menus, recipes, and photos. All of that exists on the chef's computer too, but that hard drive was my way of buying my silence, that I not go to the press with all the juice and dirt on that place they could handle. They never knew where any of the tech supplies were at any given moment and I'm sure, to this day, they think someone just lost it. Edit it was an amicable parting, and they gave me an employment which we've never done before, ever then one month later, after I was still not working, started to fight it. They tried to have it stopped twice and both times screwed up the phone hearing. I rode that unemployment for 6 months until it ran out. Back when I was in high school, sophomore, the annual homecoming dance was approaching. I wanted to ask this girl, we'll call her Jess, to the dance, but turns out she had already accepted another invitation. Fast forward to one week before the dance, I get a call out of the blue from Jess. She's stressed and sad because her date backed out on her and she already got a dress and everything. She's now asking me to take her to the dance. Now, this is a dream come true, right? Banging hot girl asking me to the dance, right? I was elated. I like this chick and the stars just so happened to align in my favor. I scrambled to get a tie that matched hers, all black everything, find a group to roll with and solidify any remaining plans. We meet up for pictures with the squad, awkwardness. We all go to dinner, awkwardness. We take photos at the dance, awkwardness. Y'all, Jess was just plain awkward. And trust me, I tried to bring her out of her shell. Ten minutes into the dance, after I've paid for all the back quote homecoming dance essentials she ditches me and ends up spending the whole rest of the evening with the varsity QB. I wasn't devastated, but visibly upset. My buddies, being true brothers, helped me get my petty revenge for the horrible evening a few short nights later. We grabbed some quick crete, a post hole digger, a bucket, and a handicap sign that was acquired questionably, pole and existing concrete and all. We dug a hole in her front yard and cemented that metherfica in there for the whole neighborhood to see. One of my roommates in college didn't get along particularly well with the dorm road. They weren't actively hostile or anything, but my roommate thought that the road was kind of a smarmy moralist with no sense of humor. I wouldn't have said so at the time, but he was completely right about that. 
Anyway, my roommate grew increasingly annoyed at the way the road would handle various alleged infractions, so when he saw an opportunity to throw a gigantic monkey wrench in the Ardis mommy plans, he took it. I lived on the ground floor of our dorm. One morning, we woke up to a rather confused ruckus coming from the floor above us, a ruckus that seemed to rapidly spread outside. Turns out somebody had released about half a dozen live chickens in the hall. So that was exciting for them, I guess. Anyway, it was ascertained pretty quickly who the perpetrators were. Some guys from another dorm. My roommate thought that this justified a revenge prank in kind, but as it hadn't happened to us, it wasn't really our place, you know? And the guys upstairs weren't of the sort to take that kind of initiative. But what really did it was that the road got everyone directly involved to agree to a meeting at which donuts and hugs would be exchanged and everybody would make nice. There were vague threats about disciplinary action if the boys didn't play nice. My roommate considered this to be a horrific violation of pretty much everybody's dignity and we weren't even part of it. He was definitely right about that one. But as soon as he heard about it, he pretty much vowed to do what was necessary to prevent everybody from humiliating themselves in this fashion. So, around 3am the morning before this exchange was to take place, he ganked a microwave from a different dorm, grabbed something from our hall fridge that had been in there so long it was practically a biohazard, hauled both over to the perpetrator's dorm, and ran the leftovers on high for 5 minutes right in the middle of the hall. And he left a note taped to the microwave that read thanks for the chickens. Well the perps wound up throwing the microwave out the window. They were not on the ground floor. But even so, they had to around with their sleeves over their mouths for the next few days. Needless to say, my RD's plans were foiled. But I'm pretty sure he was the only one at all sorry about that. Okay so here's a story. I used to hang out with a buddy that delivered pizzas. I lived across the street from the store so sometime he'd pick me up and take me on deliveries because well, it'd give me something to do to cure my boredom. There was always this one rude customer that we'd always, and I mean always happen to deliver to and one night, I was in the car all drunk and tired of it. He would literally make my friend cry. I was already wearing solid color clothing, so I decided to have some fun and grabbed his hat. He always paid in change and of course, never tipped. We get to his house and I pretend to be a worker. I put the pizza behind a chair on the far side of his porch, so he couldn't see. Sir, I'm going to need you to show me the money. He angrily pulls out his lucky bag of coins, consisting of mostly pennies. Obviously puzzled that there's no pizza at hand. Okay, I'm going to need you to work with me. You want your pizza? We are gonna have to count it out first. I drunkenly slurred. He hands me the coins questioning why I said, we instead of me. I start counting, and then I stop. I went quiet for what seemed like 5 minutes, ignoring all of his nasty comments. He was pissed, raising his voice and fists, similar to a first grader. I finally said, sir, you have to sit here and count out all of your coins. I will not feed you until you do so. What the fuck? Can't you do your faking job and count the goddamn change? No sir, new rules. We must prevent theft. His stomach started to growl knowing he had no choice. He gave me dirty looks and eventually started to wither and count his change. He was a dollar short. He called the pizza place up. I'm going to report you to your manager. Who are you? What's your faking name you slimy sheet I fucking? I told him my name and said good luck. The manager answered and said I didn't exist, making him look crazy. He slammed the door in my face, leaving some change in the pizza he couldn't reach. Me and my friend ate the pizza in celebration, and that guy stopped ordering thereafter. The manager understood, knowing that weirdo used to stalk his wife. I'm not sure if that's petty revenge but it sure was sweet. Back when I was 6 years old, this little sheet stain of a kid was assigned to sit next to me in class. He wasn't the brightest bulb in the shed. Got a pencil eraser stuck in his ear, somehow managed to dislocate his shoulder by sticking it in a spin dryer, and more. He was well known to cause trouble and be difficult, and I was meant to be a good influence on him. Anyway, one day this kid was being a real dick and tried to steal a brand new pencil my granddad gave me, British Aerospace pencil, and I tried to take it back. Little Sheet refused to give it to me, so it ended in a pulling match. 
when he intentionally let go with a sheet-eating grin in his face as the sharpened lead of the pencil jammed right next to my eye. To this day I have a little grey scar a centimeters from my tear duct. The teacher didn't see anything, so she did nothing about it. Well, my little vengeful six-year-old has vowed revenge. It was around two weeks later, when the class was congregating at the back of the classroom, don't fully remember why, and I saw the box of shared crayons was on my and sheet stain's desk. A petty little plan formed in my head. I scribbled and scribbled with every damn color in the box, across the entire table. Layer after layer after layer. Ending in muddy greenish brown, I got the yellow crayon, and signed my artwork with sheet stain's name, and ran to tell the teacher. Of course, our ex-nun teacher was furious and yelled at sheet stain as he cried and denied it. He was forced to stay indoors during lunch breaks for a week, had to scrub the table clean for the rest of the day, and was moved to a table right in front of the teacher by himself for the rest of the year. So I got to chill by myself at the back of the class and do my own thing for the remainder of the year without some little dumb as stink bug stealing my pencils. This is a bit late, but it's a good story. In first year of uni, I had a group project presentation with four other people, based on animal-derived cancer treatments. As per all group projects, one guy doesn't pull his weight, and by that I mean he researched a reference from Cancer Research UK's website that turned out to be completely redundant. He essentially contributed nothing. I came up with a plan to get revenge. There were two important details that I took in mind for this. Firstly, I compiled all the references for a search together, so I could, if I wanted to, change a reference or two. Secondly, one of the judges was quite an expert on antibodies, poly and monoclonal, which was one of our topics, to cover for our presentation. So, onto the plan, I switched a couple of our references to older, more out of date references. I then tell the guy he could take credit for a searching the antibody segment. He accepts because it makes him look good. Comes to the presentation. He stumbles his way through it, then the lecturer in question, antibody expert, asks him a bunch of questions, and then about his choice of references, which were sheet, certainty of me. Now he's at a crossroad either, he outs me for bad research, admitting he did none, losing marks and looking like a dumbass, or he looked like less of a dumbass in front of the class and just took the loss he chose the latter, and I think he learnt a lesson. Though we didn't work together again after that, so I wouldn't know. There was a guy in HS who sucked at English, I was living in Denmark at the time, and since I was American, he'd ask for help on his essays, mostly correcting mistakes. Once he asked to help write one out, to help him learn more. We did it once, and sat next to each other in front of the computer, to type it out together. Then he asked a second time, and 20 minutes and he suddenly remembered he had to be somewhere, and offered me a small amount of money, to finish it for him, after I said no to do it pro bono. We had already written the outline and I wanted the extra money, so I did it, and he got his highest grade yet. Then he was flacky about the money and always had an excuse for, why he didn't have it. He then asked me to write an English essay again, and offered twice the amount from last time plus what he owed me, promising he'd pay up this time. I warned him not to fack around with me this time, he promised he wouldn't. Same sheet happened OFC, promising to get me the money tomorrow. When he asked me to write one a third time, I still hadn't received any payment. But I said yes anyways. I had noticed he hadn't been reading them through, and saw my chance for payback. I wrote it, but in the middle I wrote a bunch of bullshit including a sentence where I called his teacher a beach for making him write the essay. Sure enough, the idiot just turned it in without reading it first. He got into a lot of trouble and couldn't blame it on me or he'd get in even bigger trouble for having me write his essays. He was mad at me and never asked me to write his sheet again. I explained why I did it and he admitted that he deserved it. He even paid me for the first essay I did, not the rest though, the cheapskate. I dunno whether I feel bad about this one or not. I used to work in a bar, in the VIP area. We'd get our fair share of big-headed types. The ones that wouldn't even glance in your direction. Lots of money, etc. I usually serve in a clockwise manner, 
serving from left to right and returning to the left to go around again, not just picking and choosing those who flashed cash, which is also an incredibly annoying thing for someone to do. I was walking along the bar and your typical valley girl type actually reached over the bar and touched me, shouting her order. I said I'll serve her when it's her turn and continued getting drinks for the other customer. One of the barmen told me she gave me the finger behind my back, so I told her out straight I wouldn't serve her. I served another girl and told her it would be 12 euros. She pointed towards the girl who gave me the finger and she had the biggest smug smile on her face and the money in her hand. So I say alright. Take the money, that's fine. She gave me a 20 euros. I don't know if she realized something was up because I took so long getting her change, but I gave it back to her, 8 euros and 5 cent coins. Just dumped it in her hand and said there ya go, and she just had a look of pure disbelief, shock, and anger. Very petty, yes, but it was very satisfying. I'm not sure if this qualifies, but here we go. When I was younger I worked at a McDonald's. Here in the Netherlands we had lot of teenagers coming in while they had their breaks from school. And they all wanted the 1 euro hamburgers, sometimes a couple of them. They were always a pain in the ass. Being rude to the staff, destroying the furniture, never cleaning up their mess, and smearing all kind of sheet, literally, over the place etc etc. One day a boy came up to the counter and complained that his burger had a pickle on it. He said he wanted one without a pickle. We were sure he didn't order one. We looked at his burger and we saw he had eaten up more than half of the burger. The rest of his friends were laughing and watching from a distance. Normally, the policy was just to give him a new burger. But this time, we didn't want to give him a full new one. We know it costs only 1 euro, but he just didn't deserve it. We went to the kitchen and we made him a new burger without any pickles. We then got a knife from the storage and cut the burger in half. We wrapped the burger and gave it to him. He looked really proud of himself to pull of such a elaborate scheme. Then he unwrapped the burger and looked surprised. At the moment we told him that, since he had finished half of the original burger, this was only fair. His proud look slowly turned into a disappointed one. My cousin, a friend and I went to knock for another friend of ours in the area we all grew up in, South London. We were probably heading off to play football, smoke weed, or try to steal a car. Our extracurricular activities were varied. The friend was in, we were sure of that, but he wasn't answering. That was understandable to me. We all took our turn at doing that sometimes. You're a kid in your early teens, and not the most socially adept. Probably in the midst of vigorously master, baiting to MTV, so you ignore the door. Nobody ever got too stressed out about that. Expect my cousin, and except that day, he knew our friend was in there, and he was not willing to be ignored. He starts banging louder and louder on the door. No response. So he bangs some more, even louder and now he's shouting too. Open the faking door you dickhead. Open the faking door, point we are. All like mate, leave it, he's probably taking a sheet, or having a wank. We'll grab him later. Our response didn't calm him down, but it did give him an idea. He proceeds to shout through the litter box mate, if you haven't opened this door in the next 10 seconds I'm gonna sheet on your doorstep. This guy lives with his mum and sister and it's the middle of the day, so we just laugh, thinking he's taking the piss. Next thing, he starts counting down from 10. Counting down, then pulling down, then crouching down. He gets to 1, and he's now in full squat position. The door still hasn't opened, and so then it happens a long brown sausage of sheets starts slowly bridging the gap between his asshole and the doorstep, then starts curling round like an ice cream filling a cone. He finished his sheet, pulled his trousers back up, and said I don't think he's coming out, so we'll leave it for now. The only time I've laughed harder is when that same cousin fell two stories onto a railing when trying to collect a ball from a roof. I guess. Calm as a beach. In college I lived in a house with five other roommates. No cable or even local TV. One roommate insisted that we set up his big screen TV and PS3 in the living room for shared gaming and streaming for the house. Within the first week, roommate started taking the power cords from the TV and PS3 and requiring us to check it out from him if we wanted to use either. He was super petty about it and hated me in particular 
because I reminded him of his older brother. Final straw was when I had a girl over, cuddling on the couch watching a flick. He gets home from work, sees us, and immediately removes the power cord mid-scene. A few days later I noticed he left the PS3 controllers and remote control on the floor of the living room. Not wanting someone to trip on them, I placed the devices up in the dish of an unplugged floor lamp sitting in the corner of the room and conveniently forgot I'd placed them there. The lamp was above eye level and the dish was opaque, no one thought to look up there. It didn't even have a bulb in it. A few weeks later, room had bought two more controllers, but remained an insufferable cunt about letting anyone else use the living room TV. This time I moved the controllers up to clear the floor for vacuuming. Two months in, four controllers and two remotes down a house meeting, is convened as lack of working TV and console for streaming, is really putting a damper on movie and date nights. Rumut is getting sheet from other rumots for being so flacky in misplacing the remotes. He gets defensive, accuses house of stealing his sheet. I act hurt by his accusation, but like the bigger man, suggest the house use my 360 and big screen for entertainment. It's set up in my room, but I'm willing to sacrifice my personal entertainment set up for my roomies. We start transitioning electronics out. Rumut is faking livid, all his power fantasies have fallen apart. He rages, picks up his PS3 from the entertainment center, and spikes it into the corner of the room knocking the floor lamp. The PS3 shatters on the wall. Four controllers and two TV remotes spill out from the lamp. I seriously couldn't have planned it better. My mum married this much older guy clearly for his money. After his cash started drying up she soon got bored. One day she argued with him over something really stupid, about him not washing the dishes, and said she was there for a few days to her daughters, my sister, she came back a week later, to find he had packed her bags, changed the locks, and without a bother, told her to get lost, completely backfired on her. She then somehow emptied his bank account, a few hundred quid, and she started telling family and friends he hit her and often, which I assure you he didn't. A month or so later she was clearly regretting the sheety stuff she did. Went over to his house to try and make amends only to find out his young Thai bride had moved in. My mother flip tried to attack them both and even tried to stab him. During the divorce he offers her 5k settlement as technically they were married when his new lady friend moved in. Mother thinking this was the last of his cash agreed. Assuming she had the last laugh she was pretty happy with herself until she found out he had sold up some investment for 200k she had no idea about and shipped off to Thailand to live happy ever after with his new wife. I worked at a small t-shirt kiosk in a mall and I had just arrived for the start of the day, 15 minutes before we opened. The mall was already open to the public to walk around, and as I was setting up the booth a woman approached and began asking to see specific t-shirt sizes. I asked her if she could wait a few minutes to allow me to set up the rest of the booth and I'd be happy to help her. The woman grew very impatient in the 5 minutes it took me to set up the booth, asking me if I was done yet, and how much longer are you going to take? Once I finished setting up and taking care of her needs. She let out a loud sigh, rolled her eyes, and ripped the bag of t-shirts she purchased out of my hand. Not long after she left, another kiosk employee in the mall came over to talk to me and told me that the woman I had helped stopped by her kiosk to make some purchases. She said the woman had complained about me moving too slow and asked what the hell was wrong with him. The fellow employee defended me by telling her that our kiosks didn't open until a certain time, even though the mall's doors were open to the public. I grew even more irritated by this woman after the other employee revealed this to me and quite pissed off. I looked at her credit card receipt and wrote down her name. I looked her up on Facebook to get additional info, husband's name, and found her home phone number on the White Pidges website. Later that night I called her home to which her husband picked up and convincingly told him I was sleeping with his wife. Don't know what happened after that. Strappin' for this one, in high school, Chris and Eric were in an ongoing war. Eric would make fun of Chris for his girlfriend treating him terrible. Chris would make fun of Eric for being in his hole. Typical things ensue. Then, things escalated. I don't exactly know why, but I think Eric talked some sheet to Chris' girlfriend, and it caused a ruckus. On Easter, Eric's dad's car a BMW was keyed to a whole other level. 
it happened while the family was at church and Eric saw Chris smirking at him inside during the service. Eric was fuming and wanted revenge. He wanted Chris mom, a single mother who was always on her high horse, to suffer like his father suffered. So Eric waited for his opportunity. Two weeks later, a freak spring blizzard hit. Eric found a cinder block outside a construction store in the neighborhood. He called another friend of his to help execute this plan. Chris had a giant, approximate 10 foot wide living room window. Looked out from his corner property onto the entire block. So Eric and company take the cinder block and chuck it through the window. Shattered it entirely. Destroyed. And then the blizzard fall out. Chris had cardboard and duct tape keeping the window closed for the next 3 months. While Eric's dad had really good insurance that fixed his car up good as new without any real inconvenience. No one ever proved if Chris keyed the car or Eric broke the window, but everyone, including all parents, knew. The year was 1999. Bill Clinton was acquitted in his Senate trial. SpongeBob premiered. Lance Armstrong was his first tour de France. I was a young lad of 18 attending my first semester at a community college. A good friend of mine from high school had decided to go off to college to a big state school. We were big software pirates back in the day and my friend decided that he was going to run a scene affiliated FTP site out of his dorm room because of the awesome internet connection they had. This was pretty common back then, it would be a few years before its staff really started to crack down on things like this, at least at this school. Life was good. The reefer and the wearers were flowing freely. I had cable internet at my house, but it wasn't super fast. Maybe a few megabit but nothing crazy. Well my friend had set me up a leech account on the FTP site to download stuff. Everything was going along pretty well, until he told me I couldn't use it from my house anymore. There was limited spots available on the site at one time and my connection was too slow to use one of them up. He wanted me to download stuff at school and bring it home. Problem was that was a huge pain in the ass. I could do it, but then I had to put stuff on zip drive to bring it home, and it was just a big hassle. The connection at the school was much faster than my home connection, but far less convenient. I relentlessly continued to leech from my home PC and ignored his requests. He banged my account. I chatted with him on Nike, but he was mostly non-responsive and didn't want to talk it out with me. Well. I also had access to his school ML and file storage basically through a Unix shell account that he had. In a fit of rage and resentment I logged into his shell and deleted all of his files related to his first semester classes. We were pretty deep into the semester by this time and it really faked him. I think he ended up failing at least one class, maybe two, because of it. I felt really bad about it for a long time, so I'm kind of glad to talk about it. I don't talk to him anymore, but I hope he is doing well. TLDR my friend banned me from his whereas FTP site, so I faked up his school life. Years ago in high school in app chemistry we were set to take a testing class. The way the tables were set up were, so that there were two to a table. Annoyingly enough, it was somewhat small so the other person would be fairly close. The guy sitting next to me tried to copy off of my test and realized it by the 10th question as I turned the page with his head turned toward my paper. The professor was too busy fiddling with something on her computer. The main thing that mattered to me was to have my calculator and scantron with my arm constantly covering the scantron on the very far opposite side of him so he couldn't see the correct answers to any questions that needed calculating. Side note, on these tests there is a scantron used to grade your answers and a separate paper with the questions. Luckily we were able to write on that paper. Anyways, back that situation, I decided to write out equations etc point on my paper, but not actually put any numbers down onto the paper and just enter them into the calculator, until I got to the answer. With his peering eyes I boxed a random wrong answer, and kept on with this. I took looks at his paper, and was following every answer. Hell, I trolled on a theoretical question and wrote down bogus explanations, but of course still writing the correct answer on the scantron that didn't make sense and he wrote them verbatim. This guy really didn't study at all. Soon enough I finished the test, got up, flashed him my answer key or scantron, looked down at his then back at me and started to look anxious. I left the table to turn in things, erased all the wrong answer marks on the questions portions of the test, before turning that in as well. 
Long story short got an A, and he missed all the questions. I learned that a crack addicted ex friend of mine robbed my house and parents of guns and jewelry for that next hit he so desired. Well there was nothing I could do, because the court already sent him to juvenile and his record would follow him, that led to more crime and problems. While taking on new classes for a new year in high school with this knucklehead sitting behind me. Without provocation he insulted me, and continued to berate my ability, to do anything about his drug, induced spree of crime. I didn't respond which is why he continued, but trust me this was only an hour of class, because when it ended I turned to him as the shuffling is the shuffling, and talking increased the noise enough to where I could say with confidence a promise of revenge. The revenge that I promised, was that I didn't really care about what he did, or what he said but one day, but not now maybe not tomorrow, but when you're 40, and you're coming home from work, or sitting in your own home watching some TV I might show up. Well I'm 43 now, and being insulted once, and robbed by an idiot obviously doesn't make me feel small or emotional. In fact most of the things stolen, didn't really matter to me, it was just I didn't know how to react to the situation at that time. Well I'm not a stalker and the internet really can't reveal something, even if I looked, because I haven't about where this person is, or if they are even still alive. I bring this up, because petty revenge can be done subtly, and the last 4 years, if it's just a whisper of what could be that's just enough to convince them to worry. My wife and I started dating, when she was in her junior year, and I was just out of high school, different schools. One day I went to her school to visit, and she was sitting at a table in the common area with her friends. Across the table, was some senior girl I didn't know and her boyfriend, who weren't part of my wife's group of friends. Periodically this girl starts throwing little wadded up pieces of paper and other assorted items at me for no discernible reason. I ask her what the hell she wants, and she starts into a tirade about the underclassmen sitting at the senior table. Of course, super mature recently graduated me considered such behavior quite below me and childish, so I let her know if she was going to be so petty as enforce some social pecking order based on age, then I was older than her and she could leave. She tried to get her boyfriend to do something, but he wasn't having any of it. Same with the school security guy. I wasn't doing anything wrong so what the fuck was he going to do anyways? Fast forward a few years, and my wife and I are going out to eat at Corporate Forks Italian restaurant name redacted. Lo and behold, our waitress was table girl. The meal went off without incident, there was no mention of hey, remember that time you were acting really crazy and childish to us? However, when it came to the tip, we left a single solitary penny, because we're really mature at this point. Now, we could have left nothing, but I didn't want her to misinterpret that we were just bad tippers. No, I wanted that one penny to tell her oh yes, we remember. Granted, I'm sure she probably spit in our food. TLDR girl was a psycho in high school, gets a penny tip as a waitress. I'm a carpenter by trade. Two years ago I was in the process of building a 600 square foot deck around a customer's pool. Roughly 70% of the job was finished. At that time I got a diagnosis of testicular cancer and my urologist suggested I schedule surgery ASAP, which happened to be in two days, on a Wednesday. The home ER winner, whom I had a good rapport with as this was my third time working for her, was great supportive, understanding, accommodating for now. I had made plans with a friend, a former cowalker and the one who had referred me in the first place, to come that weekend, and take over for me, as he had a job during the week. The home ER winner was totally on board with this. So I get my nut removed, and I'm home 4 hours later. The next day, Thursday, I receive a text at 7am. Something along the lines of when is someone coming to work on the deck. We plan to have it opened by the 4th of July. I'm having a party that day, I don't see it being done by then, I need to know what's going on. Okay now I'm nutless, doped up and irritated, and I hate ellipsis. Maybe even a little offended, honestly. I text back I'll be there tomorrow. Friday, not even 48 hours after surgery. Being the middle of summer it gets light out early. I beat the sun that morning, and every day until the job was done, 
5am in the rain, making sure I set up my cutting station, air compressor and radio right outside of her bedroom window, along with an inordinate amount of beating on sheet unnecessarily from 5-7am. I know she heard it all, and was annoyed by way of the passive aggressive kinda early start, huh? Comment I got, when I returned from the hardware store at 8am. Aside from all of the disappointments that week, the diagnosis, the surgery, not being able to receive a cosmetic testicular implant B slash C they don't make them big enough to match my other nut or the one they removed, I'm proud of how I handled it. Haven't missed a day of work since that Thursday. I was in charge of maintenance squadron's computer account. That involved replacing old equipment when it needed. At the time, there were court monitors in most of the shops, and on most of the desks. The standard lifetime for them at the time, was 5 years, before they could be replaced. We had just started to get an LCD monitors. This was great for the shops getting them, as they had little desk space anyway. It didn't matter so much for the flight chiefs as they had a large desk all to themselves. Almost all of the flight chiefs knew this, and wanted them to go to the guys in the shops first that needed the space. One flight chief in particular, a master sergeant, was an as. He was in a few times previously asking how he could get an LCD monitor in place of his court. His court still had three years to go before it's time to be replaced. One day one of our chief master sergeants, higher than MS duty by two ranks, managed to get all LCD monitors for our fuel cell shop. They had the least desk space of any other shop and their offices were tiny. The day arrived, and those new LCD monitors all came rolling in. We had one or two extras and there for some older CRTs somewhere else. I'm working on delving out the LCDs, and doing the paperwork to turn in the CRTs. MSGT as comes rolling in, and asking when he's getting his new LCD monitor. He doesn't work in fuel cell. He doesn't get one. So I told him, that he still had a few years, before it needed to be replaced. These were going to fuel cell and only fuel cell. I didn't let him know about the extra. He didn't like that, so he tried throwing rank around. MSGTS, I'm a master sergeant, I should get one. Me, no, you have the desk space for a court. Fuel cell does not, and CMSGT name has already said that these are going to them and them only. Rank has absolutely nothing to do with who gets what. The dumbfounded look on his face was priceless. I'll left to a new base around a year later. That MSGT still had a court sitting on his desk when I left. Back in 2008, when the economy started going south I had a friend that owned a construction business that made most of their money on the residential new construction boom. As things started to tighten up, builders would start giving him the check is in the mail routine when it came time to collect on work he had already done. In reality, they were playing a shell game and trying to get the houses sold quickly so they could pay everyone off and start the next spec project. He had this one guy who was a huge as hole, always lying to his face, and he was like 90 days out on multiple properties, tens of thousands of dollars. Around this time my friend had a family of raccoons decide to take up residence in his office and only discovered them after a few had died and started to smell. So one night of having to get sloppy drunk, in order to just remove the putrid carcasses from the walls he gets a bright idea. He has his son drive him to the guy's three model homes, gets in, anyone who has worked in this field knows there are plenty of non-destructive ways to break into these models, and lays out the raccoons in a manner where it was plausible that they could have just gotten in, went to living room, bedrooms and kitchen and just expired of natural causes. This was on a Friday in the summer and builders are generally cheap skates, so they will leave the air off when no one is in the house. By Monday morning, when they opened the houses up that had to be the worst smell imaginable. I'd be willing to bet they had to replace floors, bleach the foundation and repaint the place, just to get it smelling not as bad. Not sure if the guy ever paid up but it sure made my friend feel a lot less bad about the whole situation. Once worked for a complete psycho. It should have been a fun job, designing playgrounds, but the boss had some sort of issue, where he would either be shouting at everyone, or quietly simmer in the corner, scowling away. Literally everyone else except me, and one girl left as they couldn't take it, but I was too broke to leave so, whenever he shouted at me, I started shouting back. 
Of course this led to him bringing in someone new to help you do your job, which is code for show him how to do your job, so I can fire you. The firing eventually happened on the final working day before Christmas. Classy. When I went back a few days later to clear out my desk, the boss was not there, only my replacement, who I didn't really like, but had no hard feelings for. I really wanted to leave at least a petty fuck you, but how to do it, when he was watching me? Luckily, right behind my desk was a stationery cupboard. While filling my two big boxes with desk stuff, I opened the cupboard and removed the two boxes containing my business cards. I emptied them into the bin as I wouldn't be needing them again. I then noticed the boxes containing his business cards and removed them from the cupboard too. His first name and my first name are the same and our surnames, while different, are similar in length, so it was not easy to tell his business cards from mine. I threw about 20% of his business cards in the bin and replaced them with mine, randomly shuffled through the two packs of 500 cards. I was hoping he would inadvertently hand them out at trade shows so I would get phone calls and wreak further havoc, but the fact that this didn't happen means he probably had to sit down and manually sort through 1000 business cards. I teach high school in a relatively big overcrowded district. We don't get our own classrooms, but instead have to share. Last year I was informed that I would have to teach a special ed class in the special ed wing. I was told that the person I was to be sharing a room with was batshit crazy, but there was nothing I could do about it, and because we wouldn't have much contact I didn't really care. Fast forward about a week and I meet my kids, and decide that they need an extra set of textbooks for in-class use and I would keep them on one shelf in the massive cabinet that was school property. To an average sane adult this would not have been a problem because, well, we are adults and have to share the workspace. But, unfortunately for her she is not all there and this is where the story gets good. I walk into the room the next day and someone had removed the books and placed them on top of the filing cabinet next to the original big cabinet. After the class I had the kids put them back in their original place. Guess what happens the next day? If you said that they would be removed you'd be right. So I waited after class and asked her why she was taking the books out. She informed me that she needed the space for her stuff, to which I mentioned that there was nothing on the shelf that I was using. I didn't want to start a major thing, so I let it go for a few days and waited to see if she would add anything to it. She didn't. At this point I was ready to engage petty level expert. She's the type of teacher who fills the board up with handwritten notes. I'm not. Every day I would erase her notes and write one or two words. She immediately started to write the iconic do not erase, so I obliged and erased everything but a note. She was super pissed and would complain to everyone in her department. She went as far as to tell her supervisor, but there was nothing that could be done because the sheet storm that she started with me was now a category 4 hurricane of petty. And so she dealt with clean boards until I got tired of erasing them after a few months. In classic fashion, this happened a few years ago, but I was in college. Went to one of the largest schools in my state so naturally there was a lot of partying etc point on campus. One year I was living on campus in a smaller apartment and we were playing FIFA in our living room with some music on. Our neighbors downstairs decided that they thought our music was too loud, probably was, but instead of coming up and asking us to turn it down, proceeded to call the cops for a noise complaint. When the cops arrived we opened the door without checking the see-through hole and just opened. We were pretty much arrested immediately for the marijuana, in plain sight on our living room coffee table. In a hoe after we get a list of charges in the sheet of paper we can see the name of who made the call for the noise complaint, and after some sleuthing on Facebook we found this guy who was dating the girl who lived under us, and didn't even live in our three-story complex. Come to find out he drives the only large pickup truck that parks in our lot and can be heard from inside. So you can imagine over the next 10 months we lived in that apt he found everything you can think of in the bed of that truck. Ranging from dead animals, rotten meat, and the grand finale being an entire parking block from the other side of the lot. Also during the last week we lived in the complex we decided his truck didn't need the hitch on the back of it anymore. Threw it out for him. Sholdv had the balls to come and ask us to turn down our music in person and save all of us a misdemeanor charge we had to pay for. 
This kid used to bully me in elementary school for having 8 teeth, pulled the rest out for braces, and actually trying in school. Fast forward 11 years to high school and whoa what, I still try hard in school. I have him for human anatomy, I sit in the very back of class, and she pulls both of us to the front, and informs us that I have the highest grade, and he has the lowest grade and she's sitting us together front and center, and she wants me to tutor him. FML. Fine. I'm not gonna hold a grudge. So I try to help him, and he says I don't wanna learn. I just want to pass. So I say fine. We have a test a week or so later, and I notice he only has a pen. So I offer him a pencil. He huffs at me and declares he only writes in pen. Fine. Start the test, it's like the vocabulary fill-in test with a word box. And I notice he's sitting up and leaning over me to see my answers. Hell no. So I write all the wrong answers after that, get to the last two, and he just scribbles in whatever, shoots up to go to the teacher. She notices it was fast and tells him so, and he goes well it just wasn't that hard. Gets back to his seat, I lean back in mine and go HMM, G looks like these answers are all wrong, and erase the entire page good thing I wrote in pencil, since we were right in front of the teacher's desk I noticed a smile slightly, and he got pulled from the class after that. Back at the beginning of my career I was just a hardware tech upgrading PCs, before they went to the customer. Company still exists under a different name. Used to be one of the go-to guys for the HAL computers, you'll figure out who. We did a large hash of these machines, mostly PL300s and GL300s. CD-ROM drives, even readers, were still fairly expensive back then. The vendors who made them for HAL packed them in super dense foam. So one night we are working on a line of 100 GL300s. That means 100 of these boxes for the CD-ROMs have to be opened. We usually have material handlers to do this, but they were out this night for some reason. One of my coworkers roommates with one of the other guys I work with volunteers me to open them all. I'm liquor fact that. And he keeps volunteering me. Finally, with a gleam in my eye, I say okay. Now he's concerned. He should be. I open all of the boxes, making a giant pile of the foam. These boxes are about 9x6x4 to give you an idea of how thick the foam was. Finally the manager was like get that stuff out in the trash. And out I went. I packed 9 boxes full of this foam, with the boxes overflowing. Then I asked the roommate of the guy, to get me the dude's car keys. When he asks why, I shared the plan with him. He laughed and agreed. I took the trunk of this guy's Chevy Lumina, and stuffed it full of the foam. It was so full it took 12 times to try, and slam the trunk shut. I had to sit on it. He found it a few nights later, when he popped the trunk. About 30 pieces literally exploded out attacking him. I recently moved to a new state halfway through my freshman year. I came in at the sweet moment of starting a new project, based on a book. The project was supposed to be divided amongst my partners I did not know. My two partners, we will call Frank and Chad Dynasty, were always zoned out. Frank would be too busy listening to his 2010 era music with Naruto music videos, and Chad Dynasty too busy on her phone. Once we were given our books, and the deadline for the project was set, I immediately took charge and set up roles, since nobody wanted to help. It was annoying being new to the school, and having to have such a bullshit start. The deadline for the book, to be read was reached. I had read the book. I then asked Frank and Chad Dynasty. I got basically the same answer from both of them. A confused yeah. Whatever. I then told them I'll do the first three slides, Frank would do the next two, and Chad Dynasty would do her one. Frank lived in my neighborhood. When we got off the bus I asked if he had finished his part of the presentation. He bolts it home. Whatever. I ask Chad Dynasty the next day if she has her part done, and she says I forgot to sorry. I then realized my group mates were complete morons and I'd have to solo this project. Once I had completed, and it was time to present it, I handed out note cards with a script. They both were blank the first slide was the title slide, and was supposed to have all our names. It only had mine. I had completed my three slides, and it was Frank's turn to present. The rubric stated you may not read off the board. He could not figure out what to say, so I did it. Then came Chad Dynasty's slide. Her slide wasn't supposed to have much of a script other than and here is the song that matches this scene in the book and click on it. 
Like Frank, she stands there clueless. I come back and finish her part. Then came the questions asked by the teacher. She had separate questions for each group. She would ask one question per person. Frank and Shad Dynasty both could not answer their questions. I answered all three. I ended up with a 97 and my group mates both got zeros. They still pass the class though. So this happened about a year ago, when I was put into a group with my best friend. It was biology class, and we had been assigned RCPT, which is an important project worth like 10% of your final grade. For the project you had to pick an animal and compare its different systems to that of a human. So we decided to do the peregrine falcon. Now my friend was a smart fellow, so I assumed he would do his part, as it was assigned in mid-December, and we had until mid-January to do it. We kind of diced around in class and played on the school's chroma books, but I was doing the work at home, putting it all into a PowerPoint presentation that we had to present. Now the night before the assignment is due comes around, and my partner had been sick for the past week, just a fever, but he was still playing video games, because I saw him playing on Steam. I ask him where his part was, and he tells me he didn't get it done, because he was sick, I called bullshit, and he told me I had to do it. I stayed up for the next few hours finishing the project, fact checking and such, then went to bed. I brought in the powerpoint on a USB, and showed my teacher our progress, to show that we completed the assignment on time, because the presentations would take over a week to present them all, mainly because she was slow at gathering her marking papers, and getting a pen. Anyways, I show my teacher the powerpoint, and she says it's really well done, and asks which parts I did, and my partner did, and I of course tell her, that I did all of it, because my partner was sick. The next week my friend gets better, and we have to present our powerpoint to her, which I nailed, because I did all the work, and my friend didn't, because he was a lazy fuck who thought I had told her, that he did his part. She hands back the assignments at the last day of class, she takes forever to mark stuff, and I got a 90%, which I was satisfied with. My friend didn't do too well, because the only thing he did was stutter a bit, and tell her what he knew about falcons off the top of his head. Funny thing is, that a similar thing happened earlier this year, but this time he just waited to the last hour to finish his project, because I told him to submit it. TLDR. Friend was sick, and I had to do project, I got revenge by telling the teacher honestly who did what, and he got the mark he deserved. <laughs> Grew up lower income to an amazing single mom. We often had roommates to help with the rent, because my mom refused to lose the house for an apartment, because she didn't want us growing up in the crappy apartment buildings across town. One of those roommates turned out though be a lazy POS my mom took him, his wife, and their child in as the wife was a co-worker and they were also down on their luck. Husband lost his job, and spent the days watching TV in his underwear on my mom's couch. Despite repeated conversations to put clothes on this behavior continued, and soon accompanied missed rent payments. The husband and wife would often get in extremely vocal and aggressive fights right, yelling at all hours, while my mom tried sleeping 5 hours a night to work to jobs. My mom was too nice to take further action, so my friends and I, I think we were in 7th grade at this point, took it upon ourselves to torment them into finally moving out. At first I changed the banner on his flip phone to Sudi, pre-internet, took him a while, to figure out the meaning. Then I started disconnecting the TV, whenever I was home. They went on for a while with some funny eavesdropped conversations between husband and wife about the ghost and the TV. Finally started throwing his things out. The climax came after 3 months of missed rent payments and husband not going to any job interviews, I got together all my friends and the couple high school kids I knew, and we dismantled their bed, and took the mattress outside. Huge argument ensued, and I told him his piggers could sleep on a bed again, when he'd earned his keep. They moved out two days later. We had another room at move in a month or so later that was much more respectful. Freshman year biology I was always a very studious student. The teacher and I saw eye to eye on everything, and his humor was top notch. I caught his favor too much that he even gave me an error on the final the final, that I didn't turn in. Why didn't I turn it in you may ask? Well this kid was always a royal jack as to me and my friends. 
and probably wasted about a third of the total learning time in each of the classes he took with me. Now I care about that time I'd rather learn semi-interesting facts than listen to a teacher squabble with a pot of bubbling testosterone. On top of that he was a standard bully, encouraging others to rip on close friends and circulating vicious rumors. He even terrorized a close friend coming to grips with their sexuality so bad, they stayed closeted until well after high school. Well the final rolls around, and I hear him talking with some friends. He was on his last leg, his parents had had it with his slacking, and if he failed in more classes, he wasn't just going to military school. If my memory serves, his parents would send him all the way back to the country they were originally from. A devious thought appears. I'd never been one to hold a grudge but this guy, this guy I hated, and this guy, this guy also had the balls to ask me for help mid-test, there was his mistake. I made up so many terms I may as well have answered the written portion in a different language. The multiple choice was a flurry of random answers along with every stupid a joke answer on the test. After he turned his test in, I simply waited till the hour's end, slipped my test in my folder and bid both him and my favorite teacher a fine summer. I never saw that guy again. Edit, TLDR. Guy terrorizes my friends and I all year, so I faked the answers to the final exam resulting in him being sent to military school, possibly in another country. This guy I really liked was in a long term relationship, and we knew each other through friends, but only started really talking after his girlfriend cheated several times and they broke up. Fast forward to 2 months of me and him dating, she decides she wants him back and starts trying to text him and facebook him, but he blocks her, starts messaging me, and when I don't reply messages my friends, I had to block her for a while too, so she shows up to his house one day, while I'm there to give him a note, his roommates answer but no one lets her in, so she just gives the note to pass. On and he reads it, is like whatever, gives it to me says I can read, if I'm curious or just tear it apart he doesn't care. So of course I read it. And it says stuff about how I'm just a rebound, and how she'll wait, and, one line she wrote saying one day we'll be on our couch in our apartment, and look at each other, and no we made it, really just stuck, and I ended up keeping the note, and forgetting about it till I was going through some stuff about 8 months later, while I was moving. Well I ended up not being just a rebound and we are still together almost 2 years later, but you best believe I took a picture of us on our couch in our apartment smiling, and labeled it finished moving into our apartment, we made it of course I unblocked her, after she stopped bothering us, so she'd get reminded every now, and then we were still together, and since she's still blocked on his she'll only see mine. I look at the picture from time, to time and chuckle at my little inside joke. At my work, the car park out back is pretty much divided into two separate lots owned by my boss's landlord and former boss, alongside one owned by a colossal beach who is adamant that this one tiny strip of land is hers, when it's clearly not going by the plans of both buildings, the fact that my boss's landlord has been paying for maintenance of that area, etc. She essentially cut off access to her side with zero advance notice which really screwed us on deliveries as we'd been using that car park for over a decade, and did a bunch of other minor, petty crap to annoy us. Among other things, she threw a coffee at my car, when it was parked on her side, she's come and demanding that we all move our vehicles, even when they are on the baker's property, because she can't access something, which is complete bullshit too, and put up warning tape to try and stop people using that car park. She was also telling people in town she was very happy that she'd pissed off everyone who shared that car park. One day, I was leaving work and a delivery driver was leaving using the only available exit as hers was taped off which meant he had to reverse a truck up a dirt, an Evan Lane way essentially. I didn't want to wait 20 minutes to be able to leave because of that selfish beach. So I asked the delivery driver if he wanted me to just take down the tape so he could use that side. He says yes, and I get back in my car and start driving, going straight through it. Unbeknownst to me, she was standing pretty much just out of sight from where I was coming from and saw everything. 
she was pissed. She went to stand in front of my car and thought better of it. I wouldn't attempt a hit and run. But she doesn't know that for sure and it's gravel. Not as easy to stop on in that kind of situation as asphalt. At which point she simply punched the side of it as I went past. Not sure how, but I'm pretty sure she managed to open my fuel filler flap thing and yelled at the driver as he went past. Jokes on her, I was getting fuel, before I drove home anyway, and breaking through that tape, only to see her red faced, and furious felt amazing. She since put these big metal planters up blatantly on our property, to forcefully divide the properties which are too heavy to move by hand, but aren't bolted in or anything. I've been nudging them forward a centimeters or two every shift with my car. Just going to slowly move them back onto her property and continue to use them for my ciggy buds and the occasional piss. The funner thing is, while I don't think she actually realizes that the person who was contracted to make the planters is my boss's brother, even if she gets the bolted and I somehow feel he'll make sure it's not too difficult to unbolt them again if need be. Here we go. By the way this isn't too petty, but I think it's satisfactory. First year of university. First semester. Dry campus. All female dorm. I have a disability. I get set up with my own room. Learning accommodations. The works. Not much. Just stuff to help me focus. Two girls also move in. For the story. I'll call them J and B. J and B are your classical Regina Georges from Mean Girls. They act nice and sweet to your face. But in fact. Talk shit about you. And make your life hell. Until it's too late. They're also very petty. They started targeting me after one of them thought that I didn't have my documented disability. It literally took two minutes for the doctors to come back and confirm it after I was tested. They started talking shit about me, my body, and even tried protesting that I was in a single room while they had to have roommates. I wasn't the only person they harassed either. In fact several girls were either forcibly kicked out, manipulated into or simply dropped out of the dorm because they couldn't handle their bullshit. In fact, B proved to be very violent because she chased another girl and threatened to kill her. This is important because of what happens. B and J get reported and kicked out, finally. They have a month to leave. They are pissed because they got caught and they decided if they were going down, they were taking one last person out with them. Guess who was chosen? The harassment and violence picked up over the next few weeks as finals approached. I was getting more and more stressed and angry, until finally I lashed out at B. Not physically. I snapped, told her she was petty and a jerk, if her boyfriend knew half the crap she pulled he wouldn't be with her, she was mean etc. It was just anything and everything minus swearing. Here's the thing, I don't swear, usually and I actually am able to control it even in that state of mind. The last thing I tell her is, if she comes near me again, we are gonna have a problem. That's it. I stormed off to my room. Ra comes, she heard and talked to me. She says that sadly she has to write a report, because of how loud I was, and I say I understand. Next day, B gets her lawyer, so I deciphered, to get the president of student life services to boot me out. Why? I threatened her life. I apparently threatened her life. No witnesses. No audio recordings. Yeah. That's just faking petty. So I get the boot, because somehow the president has no clue about all that's transpired. Apparently B and J are getting kicked out of the dorm officially for other reasons. I have until 12pm the next day to get my stuff and go. Thankfully my dad was on his way to pick me up already. We spend 3 and 1 half hours cleaning up. I'm faking done rolling over. I'll let the girls know what's going on, needless to say, that J and B don't come out of their rooms until 6am the next morning. And I decide, that I'm going to fight back. With my family's help I write up an appeal, and a letter with documents evidence of snapchat videos, tweets even texts shared between one of their former friends all indicating their plans and plots to attack me, and drive me out. Not only does the president of student life get it, but the president of the school. Fast forward. My appeal is accepted. I go back. Classes begin. I have only one during the day. I'm buying a textbook. And I see J and B there. They're storming out of the administration office. Pissed as hell. Because they can't fight back. They see me. And I smirk and wave. 
When B gives me the finger and starts to walk away, I turn to leave, and I shouted loud enough for them to hear, checkmate beaches, 